Good evening, everyone. I would like to call our regular council meeting of April 24th to order, please. And I uh, would like um, council to approve this evening's agenda with the addition of the new business and supplementary information that you'll find on the yellow pages. Motion to approve by Councillor Ray, seconded by Councillor Berger. Are there any other additions or questions from council? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you. And we're looking for adoption of the minutes from the regular council meeting of April the 10th, please. Moved, moved, received, moved adoption by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Berger. Question from Councillor Berger, please. Yes, just on, um, Can you turn on your microphone, please? Sorry. Um, on page 3 of 10, point, uh, 5.3. It says in favor, and my name is listed there, but I actually wasn't at the meeting. Okay, so you're looking at item item three, five page point three. three, five page point three. three. Yeah, the rest of them show that I was absent, but that one says I voted in favor. But okay, it should so just be consistent that I was absent. Yes, you were not here. Thank so you. if we could just have that uh, struck through there. Are there any other corrections or questions from councillors? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of adoption, opposed, motion scary. Thank you, Councillor Berger, for that. And we do have a number of delegations this evening. We have five in total, I believe. So just like to remind all of our speakers that there is a time allotment of five minutes per delegation. We do have a timer that you'll see up here as well as the lights um, at the table there. So if you could kindly observe that and then I'll be wrapping you up at the five minute mark. It's just we have a long agenda that we want to uh, get through in a, in a reasonable time. So at this point, I would like to welcome our auditor forward from KPMG uh, and we'll be receiving a presentation on our audited financial statements for 2016. Thank you very much for coming. Good evening, um, pleased to uh present the uh, audit findings report this evening. Uh, I wanted to uh, report that we have completed our audit for the year ended December 31, 2016. The financial reports and the related additional reporting to the ministry has been completed and presented to council. The audit reports that we've drafted and prepared subject to the financial statements being approved this evening uh, are what we would refer to as a clean audit report in respect to the financial statements for the for the district. Um, the audit uh, results have been uh, presented to council in camera previously. We've had a, a discussion about a number of those issues and they've all been uh, uh, met and satisfied to, to uh, our satisfaction. I'd be happy to um, make any additional comments or hear any questions you might have in respect to finalizing the accounts for the year end of December 31, 2016. Um, perhaps, thank you very much uh, for that report. Uh, we we have talked to Council about um, we receiving some feedback about how some matters were handled last year and Council and staff together have committed to make some changes for the upcoming year. Um, also in regards, um, there were some concerns um, brought forward by members of Council and the public about how we handle our operating contingency fund in the coming year, uh, how to handle um, are any budget amendments that need to be passed and as well as um, there were some changes to the layout of how our expenses and the like are displayed in the budget. Um, is there any comment you could have on the work that we've done? Uh, this was all an attempt to have a, a nice clean and clear operating budget for the coming year. Yes, we've uh, confirmed to the finance administration that we're comfortable with the process that have been uh, suggested and are to be deployed in this next year. I think that'll achieve uh, a lot of the uh, objectives you were looking for and, and should be a little clearer to uh, your residents relative to some of the issues that uh, were being identified. Uh, okay. We like them. Great, thank you. Um, any questions from members of council? Seeing none, okay. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Yes. 
Uh, I'll move that council receive the draft financial statements of the District of Sioux year ended December 31st, 2016 for information. Okay, that's been moved by Councillor Ray, seconded by Councillor Casper. Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Opposed motions carried. Thank you very much and drive home safely. Okay, our next item up this evening is 7.2. Rural property sprinklers, and we have Mr. Randy Clarkston presenting. And if we could have the timer activated, please, staff. I won't be that long. I was asking that bylaw 404 get have be rescinded or at least modified from this present form. Um, it's asking for people that are on a limited water supply to sprinkle their houses and provide backup extra tankage for the uh, fire department as well. So it's kind of a double hit for them. I talked to my engineers and we did a they did a cost analysis of it to see what the cost per property would be. And it's running about $10,000 for a reservoir. And that's a reservoir that will produce uh, water for 15 minutes on a sprinkler system. Uh, pump station at 15,000, 5,000 for a generator, 2,500. It works out to 32,500 per, per building for the cost for just the sprinkler system. Then if I go down and look into the tankage that's required, they're, have, they're supposed to provide as far as I can read the bylaw, and I might be wrong on this, it looks like a 30,000 gallon tank with an extra 3,000 gallon tank near the property, near, closer to the building, which at a dollar a gallon, which is a standard price for water storage, that's about another $30,000. So it's going to cost roughly $66,000 per property to build a house on a rural property in Souk. I gave you a map that shows that this is half a souk, roughly, in area that we're talking. Um, I'm not sure why we're doing it. I can't find, I've looked around and I can't find any other place in BC that does this on rural properties. So I'm a little confused why we have it as, a, as part of the bylaws. Um, there's lots of reasons, like, People buy, when they buy rural properties, they know that they're in a rural environment. They know that they, their insurance charges them more because they're outside of fire protection and stuff like that. Uh, I don't think they're aware that they're going to have to spend another $60,000 to produce something that belongs in an urban setting, not a, not a rural setting. So, anyhow, I'd like to see it rescinded. I, I don't think that belongs. It's not... It, the CRD doesn't do it, so neighboring property is right next door to them. An example would be Townsend's property, just as we leave Souk here. He's building a new house. He's being stopped now for, for sprinklers. He sits right in front of a fire pond that services 30 lots in Demanuel Valley Estates. The fire pond is on his property, and yet he's being stopped for fire sprinklers. So. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I don't know why we have it. I don't know how we missed it, but it's been in effect since 2014, so. So a couple of questions, uh, if you don't mind, Mr. Clarkston. Um, so this obviously pertains to areas that are not on water. Correct. Okay. Anybody who's on a well has to produce this system. Okay. and. As far as you're aware, in outside CRD areas, whether that's East Souk, Otter Point, unincorporated areas, it's not a requirement. Not only that, but talking to Mr. Hicks and his protege there, they said that it's never going to happen out there either, this type of thing. So. Okay. Uh, and the other question I had, do you know roughly, you, you outlined the costs of what it would be to set up roughly if someone did do that, what their ongoing operating costs per year might no, be? No, it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't know what those costs are. Okay. I also don't know who's going to inspect it. I don't know if it's our fire department that's going to be forced to go out and inspect these on a yearly basis. I believe they do for commercial fire mm -hmm. extinguishers and, or um, sprinkler systems. 
So it's going to put a strain on the community as well in that we've got to service them and we have to look after them. And the water that they're holding isn't going to be able to use for potable water no. because it's just in storage. It would be still water. Be still it wouldn't water, be drinkable yeah. water so. by any means. But I imagine any infrastructure like this in a home would have to be inspected on I a would, certain basis so. to avoid leaking or whatever. Okay. Other questions, please, uh, Councillor Pearson, please. It's true, the chair, to you. Um, I don't know how. I, I remember it coming up as a discussion point, and I believe that we actually said we didn't want it in there, this, this piece of it, in, in, the, in the public, because I believe it came up the Land Use Committee somewhere in there. We discussed that, that, that it was too onerous on the, on the homeowners. But I guess what, what's, what's interesting to me is, is that I didn't see it in that bylaw when I, we read it, and I should have seen it. Um, I think we've built a number of houses in between then and now without this in, in these rural areas. You've built quite a few houses up um, Phillips Road. There's been a lot of four on tens that have gone in. All of those four and tens were done without this, as far as I'm aware. I don't, I don't know of any of them. You're in those houses, so I don't know any of them that had to do it. So I have some people here that are planning a four on ten, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, they're pretty nervous. <laughs> so uh, again, follow up, Councillor Pearson. Yes, I. You know, given that this is. Um, and because I'd like to have a chance to talk about it. I'd like to uh, make a motion that we have staff relook at this portion of that bylaw uh, because okay so maybe do we is get a it report back because I for me is my understanding that that was the piece that was supposed to be left out okay when so we introduce this for your motion then uh, for staff to bring maybe rather than are you looking for them to do a report or just to bring this part of the bylaw back for discussion well I there, in the in the essence, I'm just thinking of the staff load in the essence of time. Well, specifically with 404, but I think there must be some other things in that bylaw. So, you know, having read it over the weekend, I'm thinking. But anyways, okay, specifically bylaw 404, I'd like to have that come back. <coughs> okay, for discussion. Yes, um, a seconder, please. C Councillor Loggins is seconded. Um, discussion, uh, Mr. Howitt. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to point out that Bylaw 404 is a subdivision development and service development and subdivision servicing bylaw, and it would uh, the uh, provision for this firefighting component would only apply to subdivisions that ha happened after 2014, after the adoption of Bylaw 404. So a lot of those lots that were created out uh, in the more rural lands wouldn't have this requirement attached to a covenant at the time of subdivision activity. And the reason we opted to go with this section of the bylaw is I didn't bring, unfortunately, I didn't bring the bylaw with me. But there is provision in that bylaw for alternative firefighting methods within that bylaw that we have looked at. Uh, but getting back to the uh, four on 10, uh, unless it was recently subdivided, those, the restrictions for fire or for the sprinkler or alternate firefighting uh, capabilities wouldn't be a requirement for building on that lot anyway. I want to make that clear. Okay, Councillor Ray Berger, then Casper. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to um, Mr. Howard. I, I'm sorry, I'm, now I'm a little confused because what I hear from Mr. Clarkston is is that anything moving forward would require this, and I think I just heard you. I, I get the piece that it's not retroactive, but um, the bylaw reads that if there's a application for a building permit. It's required. So it, it may be just the wording of the bylaw, but it still reads that if you apply for a building permit, it's required. Okay. Yeah. And, and I guess uh, just as a follow-up comment, um, I, I, I'm, I'm surprised having been on a, uh, in another community on 10 acres. Uh, we were very well aware that we were outside of the fire. Uh, we took steps in terms of um, shingles and all that. So I, I think this is... $66,000, I mean, I'm a little stunned by, by that kind of a cost. So I'd like to see it come back. Okay. Councillor Berger, then Casper, please. Yes, thank you. Um, and I, too, agree with um, the councillors to my right. Um, I'm one of those people that live on Phillips Road, and we just built our house two years ago. And I do remember um, 
Mr. Kendrew, who was the landowner at the time, coming back to speak to this, and there was quite a big debate about residential sprinklers. And um, I concur with Councillor Pearson. I thought I remembered that that was sort of done away with. So I'm wondering if when we asked, and if the motion passes to direct this to go back to staff, I wouldn't be surprised if there's maybe an unresolved resolution that um, is to remove that portion of the bylaw because then Mr. Lidster, who was farther down Phillips Road, also came back to have this requirement removed from one of the, or his final four on ten or and, four and, house. And I'm concerned with the guys that are trying to get their houses built right now. They're under construction that are, they're, they're stuck. So I don't know if they can come in for a variance if we can't fix this soon enough or how they're going to be able to move forward. Well, so in, in, the essence, in the essence of time, if this um, passes, I'd like to see this on the next council agenda. Okay, would that be possible um, through to our acting CEO? Mine's working here. Your, your Worship, uh, can you, uh, can I have the uh, resolution read back, please? Was it just that one component of bylaw 404, or was it the whole bylaw coming back? My understanding is it was just this particular section. Just 4.0 to 4.5? 4.0 to 4.5. Uh, yeah, we can we can bring that uh, back, Your Worship, uh, for review. Uh, I also want to point out that as of December 31st, uh, 2017, that part of the bylaw and any other part of any bylaw that we have related to building would be illegal because uh, the province is bringing forward a new building bylaw in January of 2018. Okay, but yeah, so this so this bylaw will expire at the end of this year. But in the meantime, we can deal with this section, and that would would hopefully uh, uh, deal with the, this pressing issue now. Okay, um, Councillor Casper, please. Well, I, I, I would go a little stronger than what the motion is, and uh, I'm gonna move an amendment, and in the interim, that section not be enforced. Okay, so your amendment is then uh, particularly uh, section 4.3. Is it section 4.3? It's 4.0 4. to 4.5. So, so, so my amendment would, would be to add and in the interim section 4.0 not be enforced. Just 4.0? I don't have the bylaw so I'm going with well, what, I'm, I'm going let's make by sure what it's right the here. Reference. <coughs> okay. So you're looking, counts, just a question to Councillor Pearson. This is all under 4.0. Yep. Well, it's 4. everything 5. pertaining to it. This, this Supply, of water, all that stuff. Okay, so your amendment is in the interim, this, this I would say that. This section not be enforced. But and I would also note 4.0 of Schedule 7. Okay. Is that capturing at 4.0 or do we need to list off 4.1 to 4.5? 4.0 will cover it? Okay, Four, is, is everyone content that 4.0, just stating 4.0 will cover this? Is someone seconding the amendment? Councillor Reyes seconded the amendment. Do we, is staff looking to speak? So I know the microphones are, okay, go ahead to our fire chief, please. Yeah, sorry, we're just having a couple of microphone difficulties here. I've got a little bit of background on this. I know about three or four years ago, there was a big push with the Fire Chiefs Association of BC and the Fire Prevention Officers Association that recognizes that sprinkler systems are a very effective means of fire suppression. So I came from a regional district and we didn't have anything like this in place because the uh, cost of it can be uh, very significant. Um, we're better off as a fire department looking at the way we can move water and uh, water supply to benefit uh, residents. But in the interim, I think a case-by-case -case basis, working with staff directly, we can look at the proper kind of alternative solutions and uh, you know how you know we can look at protecting a resident's property the best way possible. Okay, so the amendment though right now is basically saying that this is not going to be enforced. So it's actually not going to allow that case by case basis until the bylaw comes back. 
um, just a follow up from staff, then I'll go to Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't have a problem, from a staff's perspective, I don't have a problem with not enforcing by or the Section 4 and the other ports of Section 4 if you, if you choose to go there, given the fact that in December 31st, 2017, it's going to be irre irrelevant anyway. And that way, it'll give us time to look at the bylaw, uh, this bylaw, and all the other bylaws that have inference on building standards that okay. we need to fix in 2018 as well. Okay, so I'm going to, is there, Councillor Pearson, were you speaking to the amendment? Yes, and, and I just want to caution, and, and I, I appreciate what Councillor Casper said, and I'll support the amendment. I just think, though, that there's some things in here that we have to be uh, cognizant of. It says that an all an all weather access road suitable for firefighting and vehicles to be provided with any requirements of right of way to all hydrants and, and cisterns in the system. So you gotta be careful that we don't wipe out that the the need to have a road getting close to these properties, right? That's just a comment to the all four point zero. Okay. But you still have to have a road access to the house. Well, I think anyone that's building a house would want a road to it though. Well, just telling you. I'm just, and, and I'm just, just saying, as that have for a fire truck. Let's wait for two weeks. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. On the, are you speaking on the amendment, Councillor Loggins? Go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to um, say that I think that uh, this system was referring to the one that would be created as part of this bylaw. So I, I thought that as well, and, and I was thinking, oh, that's probably so not something that we should not enforce. But it, I think the system is specifically to the this. Um, Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, this is specifically for the section heading water supply for firefighting in areas not serviced by water utility. Mm -hmm. So it is all related to that. Road okay. Yep. So I'll call the question on the amendment, please. All those in favor of the amendment? Opposed? None opposed? Okay, so now we have the main motion as it's amended. But for clarity now in terms of what also council's expectations are, so in the interim, this section is not going to be enforced, but we've also heard from our Director of Development Services is that this whole bylaw needs to be rejigged this year. So in this case, is Council comfortable, like are you wanting to still see this section come back and later to see we would have to repeal this and replace it with something different? Or would you rather just this stay in place and staff will bring back a different bylaw? I'll go to, our, to Mr. Hallett, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Sorry if I mis, uh, misguided you there. It's not the whole bylaw that will be need rewriting. It's only sections of bylaws that we okay. have in the district that have inference on building standards over okay. and above what the building code will be. But we will need to have those. If these are going to be de deemed invalid as of December 31st, we would want to have new bylaws in place. We can only uh, impose further bylaw requirements as, as they relate to building. Uh, if the province consents for us to do so, uh, and if they don't consent, we w they would have to comply with the building code as it comes out. Okay, so in which case you would have to wait till next year to see the new code, or when? Or I guess my question is, when do we have to have a new bylaw in place or a revised bylaw? We don't have to have a revised bylaw in place until such time that after the building the building, um, excuse me, the provincial building code comes into effect, we will have a grace period to rectify our bylaws. Okay. But in the meantime, any bylaw that has inference to building a building code or a technical component over and above what the BC building code says will not be, uh, be able to be put in play. I see. Okay. So in that case, then we'll get something back in the interim. Is that what everyone's understanding? We'll get something back yep. in the interim and then we'll wait for further direction from staff on yes. the other components. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion on the amendment bylaw or on the, on the, budget, on the bylaw as it's been amended in its entirety, as it's presented? <laughs> All those in favor then? Opposed? Motion's carried. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Clarkston Thank for bringing you. this forward. Okay, our next item up is the salt water series. Mr. Ron Nietzsche. And good evening and welcome. I'll just need you to turn on your microphone, please. Thank you. Great. Honorable Mayor and Council, um, I'm here. My name is Ron Nietzsche. I'm here in regards to the Souk Saltwater Series. 
<clears throat> excuse me, um, a little bit of a, a background over uh, as to what we've been up to over the last year. Um, this is the third year of the series. Uh, we've seen considerable growth in derby numbers and uh, in sponsors. Uh, we were at the Victoria Boat Show this year where um, we got some face time uh, with anglers and boaters um, enthusiasts in Victoria trying to bring uh, this saltwater series uh, to to Victoria. Uh, we sold some tickets um, at the uh, at the event, which uh, we were really happy with. Um, we've been advertising in the Island Angler, and uh, we raised the the Derby winnings to an average of twenty five hundred dollars per Derby. Uh, this year, we're offering $3,000 per derby. Um, <clears throat> and why this is important, um, we feel the, um, the advertising that we're doing for our sponsors is in turn, each one of our sponsors, every time we advertise them, we're advertising Souk. And we're doing this all over the island. We've got a Facebook um, or a, a whole social media package uh, that we give to our sponsors. And every time we're mentioning, mention, mentioning our sponsors, we're mentioning Souk as well. So there are definitely some benefits um, to the whole Souk community, uh, we feel. We have eight people on our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on our, uh, on our committee. And I think you're, uh, I don't know if I need to name them or not. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of cross promotion with uh, companies like Pete's Outdoors uh, that we've brought on, Islander Reels, um, and a lot of local companies like Stick in the Mud. Cross promotions where we're uh, repeatedly uh, on Facebook and Instagram uh, mentioning their names, and uh, we've tried some uh, different kind of neat stuff with uh, with their logos. Um, so I'm here uh, looking for a sponsorship. Uh, for the Souk Saltwater Series in the, uh, I'm, I think Council has um, sponsorship packages. Uh, we're looking for the highest level, which is the $1,500 sponsorship. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation and to yourself and all your volunteers for putting the Derby together and for promoting our community in this way. Um, Council, we have been supporting this for a couple of years now and we're seeing a request for the amount of 1500 in sponsorship uh, that would likely come from our council contingency. Uh, does anyone have any further questions or would like to consider a motion? Councillor Pearson. First of all, I'd like to thank you uh, for you and your committee for the advertising that you're doing in Souk. You know, as an angler myself and um, seeing what's out there and about, this series is becoming more and more popular, and it does, it, it, it's the essence of Souk, you know, it's one of the recreational activities I think that we've all enjoyed, and so I make a motion that uh, we sponsor in the order of $1,500 from Council Contingency. So. Okay, that's been moved in the amount to 1500 from Council Contingency by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Ray. The other piece I would like to share is that the um, Derby itself does put funds back into organizations like um, the Charters River Interpretive Center, Souk Salmon Enhancement, and a lot of the fish that's caught is donated to the food bank so that families have some, le some fresh fish that's caught locally. So I think that's great. Any other comments or questions on the motion of 1500? So I'll call the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you and uh, have a great season. Great. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at uh, one of your wrap-up events later in the year, or I guess early next year. Thank you. Thank you, and good luck. Okay, our next item is 7.4, and this is the Souk Transition House Society. And I'd like to welcome Arlene Rees and Rhonda Harris, please. Hello, good evening, and thank you for inviting us. Um, Souk Transition House Society provides shelter and counseling for women and children who have experienced or witnessed domestic violence. Um, in January of 2016, Souk residents in need approached myself 
and asked if we could take on the contracts, the government contracts for victim services within uh, RCMP-based victim services in Souk and surrounding district. And I said, you know, as a small nonprofit who, um, you know, most government contracts are underfunded to begin with, um, so it presents a challenge to continue to do good work in a, in a uh, financially feasible fashion. I said we'd be happy to explore this, providing the contract with um, the Community Safety and Crime Prevention Branch Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General, that those contractual obligations within the contract were met. In other words, we couldn't take on another contract that I would have to find money to supplement. Um, so in exploration of this, we decided to take it on, and, and there was a commitment made by the Municipal Council to provide um, $8,000, I think $8,300, towards the RCMP-based victim services, and um, Souk residents in need, and uh, the government and myself went into discussion. So we took on those contracts as of April 1st, 2016. Now, the contractual obligations as articulated um, in our contracts, victim service contracts with the Ministry of Public Safety state, um, and this is a direct quote, cost share contribution for police-based programs. Police-based victim service programs are cost shared 50-50 between the ministry and local governments in communities with a population of 5,000 or more and where they exist in communities with a police strength of four or more. At a minimum, the ministry expects local governments to match the ministry's contribution. This cost-sharing approach recognizes the critical role that police-based victim services play in the police response to crime and trauma, particularly in the area of crisis response. Now, one of the reasons why Souk residents in need wanted um, someone to take on the contract was because um, Rhonda Harris, our victim service worker, her catchment area for her job extends from uh, East Souk right up to Port Renfrew. Nature of her job is, uh, can run from attending a, an accident scene to going and being the person who needs to notify the next of kin that their husband, wife, child has just passed away in an accident or critical incident. Um, it's very difficult for Rhonda to perform this work with any kind of, without any kind of um, clinical support, team support, and she was a lone wolf in the detachment with the help of um, Staff Sergeant um, Jeff MacArthur. He's been very helpful um, with victim services. Now, I, I just want to sort of emphasize that Rhonda's work isn't, even though the majority of her work is comprised of um, domestic violence cases, probably, what, 80% of your work? She, does, she was the one that had to notify um, the husband of the officer who was killed in the accident a year ago in, in Langford, that his wife had just passed away. It's an extremely difficult job for her. So currently, getting back to the sort of finances of it, um, Rhonda's salary alone with, you know, CPP contributions, everything else, for the fa last fiscal year, up until March 31st, was $45,598. Her salary alone, that's no, no, uh, nothing else, no management, no infrastructure, no admin, nothing, just her salary alone. The government provided us for that fiscal year of $43,000. So already that's $2,000, two to $3,000 um, in deficit. Now, the council did approve $8,300 last year, and I'm not sure what has or if anything has been approved ongoing, but we're basically here to ask for an increase in, you know, to come closer to that cost sharing. We're not expecting you to, you know, you and the district to chip in $43,000 to match the government, but um, Rhonda needs clinical support, which amounts to over $1,500 a year. She needs, you know, she needs her team support. We need... Um, bookkeeping support, we need, you know, all the services that we are providing to support Rhonda, we are carrying ourselves without expensing. And so basically that's our request is to have that municipal contribution increase to something that is just a little more affordable and supports Rhonda in the really difficult work that she does without it becoming a burden on our society so that we can't continue to do the other good work that we're doing. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we did get a bit of a notice on this from our staff sergeant. 
Um, just a question through to our finance director. What budgeted amount do we have in the financial plan for this right now? It was 8,300 and... Uh, yes, Your Worship, in the uh, policing section of the protective services, we had 8,323. Okay. And that used to be in the community grants and we moved it in directly into that budget. So it's in there where it should be instead of them having to come and request a grant for it every year. Okay, so do we know more though? But what I what I'm hearing though is that still is leading to a shortfall. Like, what would we? What would our municipal contribution need to be increased to? Um, yes, Your Worship, uh, we didn't have all this information at the time mm -hmm. we we did the budget. Um, however, um, I do have more information on some other stuff that was in the budget on the on the uh, policing side, in particular in the, with the contract with the RCMP. Now that the um, the amount that we had included as an estimate for retro uh, salary. So there is a bit of room. I, the difference, what they're looking for, uh, would amount to about 35000 um, That would be if we were picking up the whole thing. Um, I think it's been Council's um, discussion in the past about having the uh, CRD participate, and as they did when we got into the discussion about the chairs, and that was for 30%, I believe. So. Right, the chairs. Okay. Um, so I think what might be helpful then is um, for us to receive sort of a report back that would outline what our share is, what the CRD is also going to commit to, and then uh, that there is or, or that there's sufficient funds in the police for under contingency. Councillor Ray, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship, and just wanted to thank you for coming forward. Um, if, if we do look to have a report, um, one of the things that gets confusing because I went looking for all the information today um, is in terms of where you've pulled this piece from. I'm not sure if it's actually in your contract. I, yes, um, it, I did provide you with the contract and it's, um, I think I gave you about um, 15 pages of the contract and it's it's Schedule so, B, it's page 7. Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, no, no, that's fine. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> fine because I thought it was in the contract but I couldn't find it on the website. Uh, because oh, at no. one time, at one time, and I and I don't know in terms of how things have changed, but at one time it, it wasn't required by municipalities unless it was a particular police force, like the Victoria PD, Vancouver PD. It didn't actually apply at one time to the RCMP. There's also there's also different levels of victim services among the community based, the police based. Right. Mm -hmm. So I I would uh, I'm I'm not suggesting not to help. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I would just like a really fulsome report mm -hmm. in terms of um, sort of like salaries in other places and, and the differences between the, the different programs to make sure that um, we don't undercut you or overcut mm -hmm. you. And the other question, um, yeah, no, that's fine for now. I think we need a, a staff report. Okay. Other questions or is someone prepared to move a motion? Well, I'll, I'll move a motion to, okay. to request a staff report. Okay. So a staff report on the District of Souk's requirement. Con contribution. Uh, contribution con to the police-based victim service program. Okay. Financial contribution. Okay. So that's moved by Councillor Ray and seconded by Councillor Loggins. So discussion on the motion. Councillor Pearson, please. Thank you for your report tonight. So, mm -hmm. so it's clear to me that you have the eighty-three hundred dollars in your line item already for this year, right? Is that correct? Well, to our chair, to, mm -hmm. to our I finance mean, director. I don't because I haven't had any okay. verification on that. So it's so I, so I'm asking the question for you. Yeah. So through the chair to our finance director. So that's clear. It's a line item already. Uh, your <laughs> there we go. Yes, Your Worship, through to Councillor Pearson. Um, we do have the 8300 in the per budget and we'll be sending out a payment shortly. We're just in the process of doing all, what was the gr the grants and the, it'll all happen at the same time as that. Okay. Follow up, go ahead. So uh, through the chair to our finance director, you mentioned that there is some uh, remaining from our budget item for the police services. Do you have a ballpark of that somewhere? Uh, your, through uh, your worship to Councillor Pearson, um, we've I've I would say we're easily fifty thousand even after what would be uh, funding 
our share of the extra amount, that would be assuming the CRD would um, contribute as well. If, if we were to contribute, to contribute 70% of the amount that's being requested, that would be $24,323. Um, we did budget quite a bit extra for the, the retro. We budgeted based on what we were told by the um, RCMP um, comptroller's office. And th the announcement came out, I think, sent it around to council that the, the actual amounts that were awarded were quite a bit lower than that, so. Did you have a, f okay. Councillor Casper, please. So, so, so I just want to get us back on track. Um, our presenters here um, did say they did not expect the district to pay the full amount. No. Right? Right, and so, we have oh. so 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 all I'm saying, and and I'm supportive of increasing the amount, but I think we we have to put it in context that um, that uh, we have to find out for, uh, from the CRD or through Mike Hicks what their fair share is going to be, mm -hmm. because um, because as was outlined by the presenters, the service goes East Souk all the way out to Port mm -hmm. Renfrew, mm -hmm. and you know it's a wide area yes so um, um, I, I just want us to keep that in mind because there are other matters that we also have to make sure that any surplus in the police account um, if there's a serious crime then then we could be in serious trouble as yeah. far as costs so mm -hmm. I just want to put it in context mm -hmm. and I'm sure you understand oh that. absolutely and I, I just want to add that I have um, attempted to contact my kicks on you know with extensive backup on several occasions and I haven't had a response back and I know um, Staff Sergeant MacArthur has also had some discussion with my kicks but I have not directly so well I'm gonna step out on a limb I can assure you mr. Hicks has available to him a very large substantial amount of money in grants and aids and so they can requisition on an annual basis and it's given to all types of organizations and so that's one opportunity mm -hmm. that they may have to assist you okay. so I would uh, contact him <laughs> requesting a grant and aid as one aspect mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the dollar amount is no, but it's that's not fine. like they don't have any money okay so I'll just bring this by we're mm -hmm. speaking on a motion now and the motion is specifically stating that staff will come back with the district's contribution so that's where I'm not yeah. assuming that the district will fund the full outstanding amount but it's our proportionate share and that's what the motion is covering so further discussion on the motion Councillor Ray uh, it's not quite I don't believe the motion <clears throat> in terms of the staff report um, I do, I'm not looking for the staff report to tell us what that contribution should be I'm looking for the staff report to give a broader um, outline of, of costs like I mean your schedule B says how much you get paid by the contract it doesn't tell us if we're, there's overtime in there what your hours are are you covered for mileage if you're going to Port Renfrew you know the District of Souk you know in terms of that I just like a more comprehensive this is a significant uh, amount of money being requested and I just think we should do our due diligence to make sure without any suggestion of of undercutting you know um, the important role you play in the community um, but I just to make a, a financial decision I, I'd like a, a fulsome report in terms of what the pieces are to it okay so is is the language <coughs> that's uh, presented is that capturing what yes your intent yeah. is and Include then that's been counsel. seconded by Councillor Loggins are you comfortable with the changes that was the original okay. actually including mm -hmm. the cost okay Councillor Pearson Well, for me, is um, I don't know that we want to know what their expenses are. The, mi the ministry is already providing the, the funding. We're only assisting the funding, and I'm trusting that the ministry and that, that, that this has already been taken care of. Like, I'm not sure what we're del delving into here as a, as a district. I'm not sure what your question is. Sorry. No, <laughs> no, I just. No, okay, back. Okay. Do you have that answer, Councillor Ray? Uh, your Worship, I think what I'm, I'm asking is. is if we go by what was presented this evening and the costs are 50-50, what this is telling me is that this is an $86,000 program. 
have for the services of one person. I just, uh, to me, you know, it, I just don't know where the costs are um, in terms could of. Could I clarify one point? I was not asking for a 50 50 match. I no, was asking no. for a, no, I a understand contribution that. that you know, is just a little yeah. better than... Okay, so perhaps, if I, finish, um, if, I if I may, our staff will be crafting a report that will come back, so perhaps they can connect with you and just sure, clarify sure. Mm -hmm. these pieces, and then that will sort of resolve things for Councillor Ray. We're not making a decision on the funding tonight. We are just making a decision to get the report, but I just want to be sure that staff have the appropriate direction so they know what to come okay. back but with. But if I can finish? Okay. Your Worship, sorry to belabor this. But what we've been presented with, it says, at a minimum, the ministry expects local governments to match the ministry's contribution. So that's where I'm coming from. That's yeah. not that you're asking for it, but if mm. that is what is in a contract, that's telling me that the ministry is suggesting that this is an $86,000 program. So that's why I'd like to know what the costs are. Yeah, no, and I, I hear what you're saying. I also do feel, though, that the Juan de Fuca has to contribute a part. So if it is 50-50, 50 by the province could mean 30 for us and 20 for the I don't know exactly what that's going to be, but I do see the other portion being picked up by the Juan de Fuca. But we can get that clarity spelled out to us in the, in the report. Councillor Berger? Councillor Pearson for the last time? Nope. Anyone else? Are we clear on what the motion is? Anything further? All those in favor then? Opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you very much Thank for you. coming and also for the valuable work you performed to our community. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our key, our final d delegation this evening is hashtag divided by 14. And Mr. David Evans is presenting. Welcome. I'm not going to start my clock. I'm going to talk for hours. Uh, no, I won't. I, at least I'll try not to. Um, so my name is David Evans. I, I live here in Souk. I run a small business. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, stick in the mud. And uh, recently I got together with uh, a bunch of, I'll call them colleagues because we have almost nothing in common. Um, but what we found that we do have in common is the, uh, the recognition that Highway 14 sucks. Um, and it doesn't really provide safe, hassle-free access to the souk side of Highway 14 or to the CRD side of it. So we came up with this thing called Divided by 14 as a social media hashtag and campaign. And we've had coverage on CBC Radio in Victoria. I think Czech News has contacted at least one of us. Um, souk Pocket News, Souk Voice News, Goldstream News, YYJ Chat online, uh, the local Souk News Mirror as well, and maybe some others. But as the darlings of the election campaign, we lost track. Um, Briefly, Highway 14 by the Numbers is a campaign to command awareness and provincial support to improving Highway 14. Uh, we've met with Kathy Noel of the BC Liberals. We've met with Brendan Ralphs of the Green Party. We've met with John Horgan of the NDP. He's our incumbent. Um, I also put a phone call out to the Vancouver Island Party. Didn't hear back. And I called the BC Conservative Party to see if there was a candidate, and they asked if I wanted to run. So they don't know who I am, obviously, because that's, yeah. Um, anyway, but those people we did speak with, uh, Noel, Ralphs, and Horgan, they all completely understood, they all completely sympathized with the notion that Highway 14 divides Souk from the rest of the CRD. And actually, I like that distinction that we don't have a road link, we have a division. Um, we're divided from the rest of the CRD by Highway 14. Now the ministry, they might have a different perspective. They'll tell us, they did tell us, that there are other communities in BC with only one road in or out. And to that we countered that, well, those communities that have one road in or out are not part of the capital regional district. We're not part of that souk to Sydney. When people think of Victoria, they don't think of Sydney to Machosan and Langford. They think of Sydney to Souk. But for some reason, we're divided. Um, when commuters from Oak Bay or View Royal or North Saanich go to work, they might worry about whether or not they're going to get a coffee on the way to work. People from Souk might worry if they're actually going to get to work today or not uh, because the highway shut down. Every potential for improving the social health, to encourage cultural growth, to stimulate economic development in Souk is hampered by that link or that division. If the province steps forward and fixes that road, we know they've been studying this for 20 years, we know they've been buying land for 20 years, we know there's a plan somewhere to, to get some work done on that road, then everything in Souk's going to be easier. Everyone who's spoken before me tonight has one thing in common, at least one thing in common. Randy and his friends who want to build use that highway. Um, the two ladies who were just up, Arlene and, and uh, 
and I'm sorry, I've forgotten the names. They use that road to do their work. Uh, Ron Nietzsche, all the guys who come to Fish and Souk use that road. It's the one thing that really combines us all together, but it divides us from everything else in the CRD. So what I'm here to do is to challenge you, your worship and council, to, um, to reach out through social media with a hashtag divide apart by 14, to post a photograph of yourself and a number, a number that means something, and explain how that number divides you by the rest of the CRD. So for example, last Wednesday, I think it was the 19th, um, there were two accidents on the highway that shut the road down. Not that caused inconvenience, but that actually shut the road down for a period of time. So one example of what, how to post divided by 14 would be two. The number of times Highway 14 was shut down on April 19th, hashtag divided by 14. And what this does is allows people to search up the fact that we're not just one weirdo in a coffee shop who thinks the road's bad. There's a bunch of people out there who have this common, common concern. We're really trying to get a grassroots uprising for highway improvements around here, and that is what this campaign can be if we can get people to buy into it. We have had coverage, we have had people taking it up, but we really want to broaden the appeal. So while this campaign, Divided by 14, will affect everyone in this room, it's not really for us, it's for those 13,500 other people in Souk who think the status quo was fine for yesterday, but really today should be better and tomorrow should be better still. We want Souk to fulfill its destiny, that's all we want. The bunch of us who got together, and whether that destiny is as a recreational hub for the South Island, something to think is think about is that everything that Vancouver Island has to offer is available within 30 minutes of where we're sitting, whether it's fishing or hiking or camping, mountain biking, road biking, food mecca, beaches, retail destination. It's all here, except maybe a ski hill. But everything the island offers, we have within 45 minutes of 350,000 people, except they can't get to it or they can't get to it conveniently. The, the last thing we want is someone to come to Souk looking for a great experience and having a bad one and taking that story home with them. So Souk Highway by the Numbers is the hashtag divided by 14. If you could please help us out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans, and I certainly appreciate everyone uh, that you're working with and the campaign that you're doing because that is um, not just council out there that's um, advocating for improvements, it's other members from the community as well. I was, as you were speaking and challenging us to think of a particular number, I suppose what I could do is look through our records and see how many letters I've sent to the Minister of Transportation on this very matter and, and use that, so. That's a number I'd love to see. That would be great. Okay. Thank <laughs> so you. I know they're in the files and uh, perhaps staff can work with me and we can pull out the exact number. I have uh, fallen a bit behind. The intent was to send them a letter every time there's a closure and it was like they were constantly going out and then this year I haven't sent them with the election, everything's sort of frozen but the idea is to ramp up again after we know who the new, is the same or different minister in place and continue on um, and see. I mean they have responded in some ways uh, at, at UBC or at UBCM in the past uh, we talked about the paint on the road and how it keeps um, fading away so quickly. They're putting in a different and newer, longer lasting sort of paint starting this year. Uh, we he had suggested what road closures that our residents go, go on to drive BC and find out where, when and if there's a closure. And I cheekily at the time said, well, that would encourage driving with and using a mobile device at the same time. And there must be better indicators. So that's where they're installing that digital sign on the four lanes. So at least residents coming home would know that there's a detour, but it still doesn't do anything for residents here to know that there's something happening. So it's, it's the beginning, but it's by no means an, an end to anything. And we do know that they have completed their report. Um, there's been some announcements that have come out, but I actually haven't received the final report from their corridor study of last year. And I suspect that will, it was to be in the spring. We're sort of mid-spring now but that'll likely then come released probably after the election, I would assume. Um, I know a few residents have done some freedom of information requests for it, and they were sort of told it wouldn't be till the summer, so I imagine post-election we'll get it. It's all fine to do a study, but what is the commitment, and what are the short, medium, long-term objectives, and how are they going to fund it, and what are they going to do? I think our residents know that there's been study after study done, but it's like you say, they want, we want to see some definite action, so it is timely with the provincial election. I understand there's no candidates debate tomorrow, so it'll be mm -hmm. interesting to see what questions are asked. But thank you very much for the campaign. Thank you. Councillor Ray? Uh, yes, thank you, Worship. And I just think, um, you know, that there are members of council who have been advocating, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of behind the scenes for quite some time. 
Uh, it's, it is a slow process. And um, in terms of uh, your pictures of, uh, and your um, personal experiences, can they be an older picture? Because I oh, absolutely, certainly... anything. Really all we yes. want is to populate the hashtag all over social media, Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, wherever you want to go. Yeah, no, I used to do a lot of it when I was on transit commuting between here and Victoria. So I'll, I'll go back through it. That historical That'd perspective would be great to see. Yep, Councillor Berger, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Evans, and thanks to you and all of your colleagues for starting up such a what I see can be a really fun social media campaign. So um, my son just got his driver's license this past year. So I've listened to him and all of his buddies complain quite a bit about driving on Souk Road. So I'll get them involved as well. And I think it'll be a fantastic social media blitz that you could have going. Thank you very much. One thing that I, I do want to be clear on is that that road is also a road of tragedy. And we don't want to belittle any of that. So while this is a, a social media campaign to sort of have a little bit of fun and, and maybe poke a finger here and there, we don't want to, we don't want to, uh, hurt anyone's feelings by this, so the highway can be unsafe at times. Councillor Loggins. Um, thank you for presenting. One of my favorite things about this campaign um, is not just that it's grassroots, but also that it plays into several things that we've been pretty much complaining about, I'll use that word, um, as citizens and of, as council here, which would be our lack of access to hospitals, mm -hmm. Um, and our BC Transit service, which probably won't be updated anytime soon. Um, so I, I'm hoping that people will add those hashtags onto, onto yours and kind of <laughs> get all those different uh, service providers. Only 140 characters, place. remember. Yeah, exactly. Just uh, <laughs> those are important ones too. <laughs> Councillor Casper, then Pearson. Um, I'm just going to suggest that when, if and when Highways makes a presentation to us, that we invite the group. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I would appreciate the invitation. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Evans. I think that uh, these are the type of things that set Souk apart, uh, community and, and a hashtag. And, and like you say, a little bit of, little bit of fun, but in a serious message behind that fun. So uh, hats off to you and your group. It's, 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 a, it's a really cool thing to do, and I think it's really relevant to, to all of us that live here in Souk. So thank you. Thank you so much. Divided by 14. Excellent. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, so number eight, unfinished business. I don't believe we have any. So we'll move into our public question and comment period. Uh, this item is for residents. Um, you have two minutes to speak on any item in this evening's agenda with the exception of the public hearing, which is 7,000 Melrick Place, is that particular section has its own designated public hearing. So this would be an opportunity on any other matter and if you could uh, provide us with your name, your address, and which item you're speaking about so that we can find it in the materials. Uh, good evening and welcome. Hello, Terrence Martin, 6517 Stonewood Drive. Um, I'm speaking to 151, uh, the uh, parking for kayakers at, at Whiff and Spit. Um, in reference to the previous gentleman uh, coming to Souk for a great experience and having a bad one, I don't think there would be a worse example of that within that correspondence. I don't know if council read that correspondence. Uh, it's faintly shocking to me, but I'd, um, uh, this relates to the, the park down on the, on the uh, river there as well. Um, the kayakers are frequently seen on the river and parking for kayakers uh, is not just an ocean going kayak uh, experience. Uh, the reason they're going to Whiff and Spit is pretty simple. You can drive right in there, you can park there and you can unload your kayak and get it into the river. Um, Mr. Howitt has uh, provided a brief reply to me as, as directed. It's wholly inadequate. Uh, I replied to him. That uh, didn't show up in the council package today, but uh, that was over the weekend, so I'm not surprised. Um, I'd like, uh, through you, uh, Madam Mayor, um, or to you, Madam Mayor, uh, to have council take, a, take that matter in hand down at the Sun, River, uh, Sun River's Edge Park there and address the issue of access to that park in the water. Uh, it can't be me coming back here for a fifth time to possibly a fifth meeting, and I've been brushed off very well by Mr. Howitt. It's not a matter... Councillor um, Casper. Perhaps um, just as a suggestion that, that the Speaker tailor uh, his remarks so they're not directed particularly at an individual or person, I would just ask that you do that. Uh, fair enough. Uh, the re reply was from there, so it'll be in your, in your correspondence from, from myself to, to Council. Um, the matter is not whether or not the approving authority has the authority to grant relief to access. I don't believe the provisions were met. It's whether the relief from access should be granted. 
that's a matter of public interest. It's a matter for council, and uh, I would like to see council uh, address this. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, we are aware of the item that you've spoken with, and I'll leave um, council can give that thought and decide if anyone wants to bring it forward uh, any further than and on from this point onwards. Okay. To our Mr. Blackhall, please. Yes, Your Worship. I'd just like to add that is. Uh, a matter solely for the approving officer. Okay. Thank you. Other members of the public have any comments or questions on this evening's agenda? Ellen Lewis, 5526 Suit Road. <clears throat> I just wanted to speak to the Highway 14 issue. I know that you have a memorandum of understanding with the, with the highways, and I don't know how much understanding is happening with this because there sure doesn't seem to be any dialogue. I have, uh, I also understand that they've uh, changed their trimming on their roads to one and a half meters. They're not doing the full trimming, so that's one of the reasons wh where there's a lot of issues that their tree branches are growing way out to heck and gone that you can't see coming out of any area and it's really limited spaces and they're also uh, as uh, Mr. Evans said this is ongoing I know 30 years ago when he came here I remember highways coming when we were still the CRD talking about the second road that's already been there it's uh, the line is there or the plan is there to put in a second road what's happened with that I mean that can be a push that can be put by council uh, it just seems ridiculous that we don't have that second road behind 17 mile house there there it's already there there's a road way allowed there and it was supposed to come through and come down the goose which still does belong to highways i believe it's now a park but it is or used as a park for guilt for uh, <clears throat> for the crd but it is a highways property so priorities have to come in order either we put in a double or uh, two roads the double laning isn't isn't the issue because that's not going to do anything close the roads and living where I am I just saw, I've seen it I see the people all the time and and that's even going up Ludlow when that subdivision was allowed to go up there there was no turning lane put it up there and people were hit almost daily almost daily I was I actually kept a frozen face cloth in my freezer for people that were getting smacked because it's Really, because that's how insane it is. So um, this this is not just a light thing. This has this has to be dealt with now. It's it's serious. Uh, there were two accidents. Yes, one on Parklands and one in front of our place there, and which kept us awake all night with all the banging and clamoring. So um, I would I would really hope that this is pushed further. They call out highways. They come out here and they hear what the people here in Souk have to say. I can assure you that council has not been idle on this. Oh, I and understand, but sometimes yes. sometimes it falls on deaf ears. I think they need to come out here and, and be harassed by the people that live here and are, are suffering from it. Well, you see, too many times people miss their planes or miss their trains or miss their, 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 they have young people that they have to pick up at the ferries. I've been out there directing mm -hmm. traffic and I see the terrible things that people are up against. They're frightened because they have a three-year-old that's coming on a ferry or something like that. It's, it's terrible. Oh, and, it and I think highways has to be made aware that this is not an idle thing. It's, it's very serious. No, I, I assure you that we, we've been doing a lot of advocacy work. Uh, one hashtag for you, you could have one of the number of sleepless that. nights that you've had. What's that? I'm sorry? The number of sleep, the sleepless nights or hours you've been awake due to an accident Every night. or something. Yeah. <laughs> so 365, 24-7 would be your hashtag. I Good guess so. Thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Other speakers, welcome. Hello, Jeff Bateman, 7083 Briarwood, and I have just some random notes tonight. Um, first of all, um, many have pointed out the flaws to Highway 14 before, but I must commend the Divided by 14 group for their initiative. Uh, consultant Patrick Marshall's report is very convincing, and it's excellent timing since this does need to be a campaign issue in Langford, Juan de Fuca. Now, on to item 12.1, 
Regarding the council liaison, I regret that we at the EMCS Society missed the opportunity to request a liaison this year. We benefited from Mayor Tate's attendance at our meetings in 2012 to 14, and we'll be sure to make a request next year, as will Transition Souk. Um, let's see, I also have, under correspondence, um, page 213, I, I really respectfully request uh, the district to heed publisher Britt Santowski's request that the Soup Pocket News be given its share of district advertising revenue with the Soup Pocket, uh, with the Soup News Mirror having declared itself a multimedia company operating on a digital platform. I think the playing field is increasingly level. Uh, page 230, I agree with Mr. Martin that we should be actively discouraging gated communities in Souk. One at the beautiful western edge of our harbor is, is enough. Thank you. Uh, page 238, I urged Mayor and Council to write a letter in support of the Salish Sea Trust's campaign to make the Salish Sea a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Our MP, Randall Garrison, has done this, and I think suit can easily follow suit by the deadline, which is this coming Sunday. Uh, Finally, um, I caught a few typos on page 156 regarding the anti-bullying and harassment policy draft bylaw. So I just offer this for your information. Any quote, this is on page 156, halfway down, any act of bullying, harassment, or disrespectful, that should be disrespect. And in the same paragraph, it's standards, not stat dards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bateman. We appreciate uh, others also reading through all the materials. Mm -hmm. And any other comments or questions or from members of the public on this evening's agenda? Call first. Well, this is on the agenda. Do you have Brailsford? I'm s that's the public hearing. Okay. Yep, so that'll be the next item up. Thanks. Okay. Thank Ms. Lurz, were you wanting to make a second comment? Just trying to find it. There's a question I'd asked a few meetings ago. Um, on page five, you have the, the council authorized uh, on the report of released in camera resolutions. Council authorized district signatories to sign a license of occupation with uh, prestige holdings for the purpose of permitting access to and egress from the aquatic lands. Could you describe that, what that means? As I understand in their original agreement, this was sort of part of that, but there is a full public process that's going to now come forward in terms of the prestige getting uh, uh, the approvals to do a marina. Is, is that basically summarize that? I'll get staff to respond a bit further, Ms. Lurz. Thank you, Your ahead. Worship. The original agreement um, documentation back when the Prestige first started, there was an agreement that we would allow the Prestige to utilize our pier facility to get to uh, their future uh, wharf facility, if, you can, if I can use that vernacular. They have now gone through the rigors uh, of dealing with lands parks and housing or whatever they're called these days to secure a water lease in front of our pier for that wharf. Uh, the documentation is uh, been uh, vetted or the documentation that will allow them to utilize our pier has been vetted by our solicitor and has been signed off and agreed to and should be, uh, should be all agreed to uh, by now I would hope. So they now have or they will have permission to utilize our pier to get there to their wharf. Okay, so uh, question <clears throat> that brings another question. Be, um, there's two questions. One, what happened to the $300,000? Where did it go that we used to pay to the prestige? And the other question is, are we charging them to use our facilities? So the 300000 I believe, was the... Um, to, the exchange, the partnering agreement yes. for that's expired. So but where did that money go? Get moved to? It just doesn't. It's just not in the budget. It's not in the plan anymore because it's not paid anymore. So there was a specific, and I think the last year was free. It was renegotiated. One dollar. Right? And then there was. So it's just not in the budget because there's no further expenditure. Okay. So it just doesn't exist. And sorry, your second question. 
is there any cost? Are, are we getting any monies from the prestige for using or for the water lease for using our access from our properties? No, I'm seeing no. No, we're not, Your Worship. No. Mm. Well, I would question why we're not, because we did give them $300,000 a year. It would be nice to get it back. It was part of the original agreement. What we received, we paid the 300000 for conference meetings, so many meeting rooms available each month that could mm -hmm. then go out to for use for a not for day. profit. Yeah. And so that was for that. And then the original agreement allowed for the marina to come off of our pier. So it's just that was what was negotiated at the time back in 2010, 29. Mm -hmm. 2009 okay yeah. I'll, I'll have another look okay thank you okay thank you very much Ms. Lures okay so we will now move into our the rest of our agenda so our first item up is an item 10 7000 Melrick Place bylaw number 663 zoning amendment bylaw 600-35 and it is a public hearing is there a presentation from staff please thank you your worship I'm just going to put a uh, maybe. <laughs> there we go. Shoot. Yeah, here. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, this rezoning application received first and second reading at the last council meeting has come forward to the public hearing. The applicant has applied to rezone 7000 Melrick Place north of Brailsford Road from RU2 to RU4 as shown on the, on the map on the slide on the screen. The existing RU2 zone requires a minimum of lot size of 4 hectares for subdivision purposes. The proposed RU4, RU4 zone permits a minimum lot size of 1 hectare for the purpose of the subdivision that you see on the screen. The property is designated as community residential by the, by the official community plan and this rezoning application is consistent with the plan. Uh, because it went through, uh, because there was a full staff report at the first and second reading, um, I'd be able to answer questions, but I thought that this would be quite self-explanatory going forward to the public hearing. Okay, are there any questions from members of council at this time? Okay, so we'll move into the public hearing and I just have a statement to read out first. This public hearing is being held pursuant to the Local Government Act. At this public hearing, any person who believes that their interest in property is affected by the proposed bylaw will be given a reasonable opportunity to be heard or to present written submissions respecting matters contained in the bylaw that are the subject of this hearing. Copies of written submissions received to date are available. It is important that all who speak at this hearing restrict their remarks to matters contained in the bylaw and my responsibility of chair of this hearing is to ensure that all remarks are so restricted. For those of you who wish to speak at the appropriate time, please commence your address to council by clearly stating your name and home address. Then you may give us the benefit of your views concerning the proposed bylaw. Submissions must be received before or during this public hearing to, in order to be considered by council. Members of council may, if they so wish, ask questions of you following your presentation or submission. However, the main function of council members this evening is to listen to the views of the public. It is not the function of council at this public hearing to debate the merits of the proposed bylaw with individual citizens. Everyone who deems his or her interest in property to be affected shall be given the opportunity to be heard at this hearing. No one will be or should feel discouraged or prevented from making his or her views known. Please note that this hearing forms part of the regular council meeting and as such is being video recorded. Videos and their contents including any personal information disclosed during the public hearing will be posted and remain on the district's website. So at this time if anyone here is to speak to this item particularly I would like to welcome you forward. Thank you. Sorry for my, I've just never done this before. Um, my name is Mark, I live at 6998 Brailsford. And what it is, I'm the adjacent lot to the proposed new subdivision, which I think is great. I think it definitely needs it. I'm all, I'm all for that. I help build 80% of Brailsford as it is. Um, I am a carpenter by trade, and Souk needs it. Um, my concern is, and I can't really get an answer from downstairs, and really this is what it comes down to, is I need to know what's going on. On my side of my lot, I got like a 25-foot rock wall, and they've already gone in. They put um, icy chambers for two lots beside me, which are on this piece of, you know, on that hashed area where they're already saying there's going to be two lots, whereas, um, I guess, uh, 
how do you say, um, <clears throat> um, somebody's come out and actually plotted the lot basically and said this is your property for these potential new two lots that would be at the end of Brailsford. Does that make any sense? Yeah? So what, just from what I'm understanding, all this is talking about is saying that we're going to potentially build a subdivision or that has only two and a half acres is what I was reading on it, which I'm, I'm okay with having half an acre. I got no issues with that. I'm just concerned about my rock wall and my property because I own about 12 or 16 feet of that rock wall and I just I don't want to see that endangering my family or my child is my only concern here. I'm all for building. Let's, I'm a builder. Let's do this. But I, I can't get an answer from downstairs and that's why I'm here to try to speak my mind and see if we can come up with, if I can get an answer out of something. Okay. So perhaps um, if I may have an answer from staff. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm not exactly sure the specifics of what you're talking about. I wish we could get the... the Can we get that back up real quick? I'm, I'm trying to get this back up. Can I, can I come in to show you? Just, just hang no, on. these yeah, are no. um, just because of the webcasting and for everyone to hear you, okay. you kind of have to stay fair where enough. you are. Yeah, but fair enough. once uh, we get the... No problem. No. It'll just be a second here. There we go. Okay, so you're currently, you reside on Brailsford Place? Yeah, I'm the adjoining lot in the cul-de-sac there, the very bottom right corner. Yes, I'm in the cul-de-sac, exactly, yes. Okay, and you're right beside that hatched area there. Yes, exactly, that's my joint, yes, exactly. And that's where along the side then of your property yes. is the rock wall? Yes, and it goes up to 20 feet max, like it's a massive rock wall that prevents, that's my divider of the property line, and like I own 12 feet of that wall or even 16 feet of that wall. Okay. And what they've done now is, like I say, they've gone in, they've put icy, ch icy chambers in, meaning there's going to be two lots there is what the, the road company's doing in there right now. So I don't even know why they're putting anything in there that's already happening. There's water lines going in. There's two water lines going in there for two new houses on my side of the street in that hashed area. Your 6998? Yes. Yes. The very last street, the very last house on the street. There's only going to be one lot. Not one that's the whole conversation. That's what this is saying, but not for what's going on in the roadworks and not talking to Dracor, who's doing the work down there. I can't, so what it comes down, I can't get an answer from anybody is what comes down. Okay. I've gone downstairs and I've tried to get an answer for the last couple of weeks. Nobody will give me an answer as to what is going on. Okay. Like, I'm just concerned. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Howitt? Sorry, I think I finally <laughs> figured out what you were talking about. Uh, the colored portion uh, is going to be, if the rezoning is successful, the colored portion would be the subdivision of one lot. Uh, the remainder would be the subdivision, or they uh, may be subdivided sometime in the future, but not at this point in time. So what down beside me, is that, so we're not even talking about that right now. So I'm, we're yeah, I'm not aware of anything going in there. Okay, uh, well, right now there is there's two icy chambers right okay. now. There's two lots going in right now. They're, they're prepping for it. Like, I'm a builder. That's what they're doing. The water lines are going in. The icy chamber's there. Everything's there for it. Okay, the only thing I can do is to, uh, get some information for you and get back to you. See what's going on. Uh, but I can't, like, I can't address it tonight because I'm not sure why they're putting in something when Nothing like maybe Drake Corps is not following what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, it's I, quite I, obvious what they're doing. Yeah, okay. okay. I'll, I'll have to check on that. So, so if you could uh, maybe leave your contact information with staff, <coughs> uh, just a, a pho your, your name and phone number, then they can look into it and follow back up with you. Thank you. That works. Okay. And who do I talk to you later? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Over to our staff. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so do we have other members of the public here to speak on this particular public hearing item? I may call for a second time. Are there any members of the public here to speak on bylaw, zoning amendment bylaw 635, 7000 Melrick Place? And third and final time for this public hearing. Any members of the public wish to speak on this item? Seeing none, then I will officially close the public hearing. And okay, the suggested action by staff then would be that council move third reading. Move third reading of the bylaw by Councillor Casper, seconded by Councillor Pearson. 
Is there any further discussion on third reading of the bylaw? Councillor Ray? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I just want to make sure I understand. We've just got two, we're just subdividing the two pieces. We're rezoning. Rezoning, sorry. Yeah. Yes, rezoning. Yes. This one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just, I'm sorry, Your Worship. I just got confused by the comments that were made. So. Yeah, it's actually they're moving to a, a different, they're down zoning. Exactly. Okay. Any further questions from staff? Or, pardon me, from council? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So next we have items 11.16671 Wadhams Way, a rezoning application. And this is regarding 66, like I said, 6671 Wadhams Way. Uh, this came forward, uh, Councillor Pearson brought this forward and it has to do with uh, the property that we hold in terms of putting forward a town center. So we do have a staff presentation on this. Welcome our planning staff, Ms. Lecision. Thank you. Not tonight. Good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. The following is a brief overview of a rezoning application at 6671 Wadhams Way, commonly known as Lot A, which is owned by the District of Souk. The entire parcel is 5.26 acres of land and is located at the north end of the town centre. Currently, the property is owned R1, large lot residential, and it's proposed that the parcel be rezoned to CTC town centre mixed use. The CTC zone will facilitate the location of a new community library and provide a mix of commercial, residential and institutional uses for the entire site. The parcel is designated town centre in the official community plan, which supports revitalization, promotion of mixed uses and a strong civic presence in the core area of the community. This application is supported under policies outlined in the official community plan as well as the town centre plan. The existing neighbourhood includes a mix of residential, commercial and institutional uses already. Um, staff has no concerns with the application as it's consistent with the district policy and the strategic plan. Okay, questions from councillors. Councillor Pearson. I move first reading. Second. Move first reading by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Ray. Any discussion on first reading? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None opposed? Move second reading by Councillor Ray and seconded by Councillor Loggins. Any discussion on second reading? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. Um, I'll move that a public hearing be scheduled. Move that a public hearing be scheduled by Councillor Casper and seconded by Councillor Loggins. Any discussion on scheduling a public hearing? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. I'll move that the land titles be notified the following legal notation. Sorry. I'll move that that uh, land titles be notified that the following legal notations on 669 or 6671 Wadhams Way may be cancelled. And I'm not going to read out all those numbers. As stated then. As stated. Okay. Seconded by Councillor Loggins. <coughs> Any discussion? All those in favour? Opposed? Motions carried. Okay. Thank you very much everyone and Ms. Lecision for the presentation. Okay. Moving on to 2017 property tax rate bylaw. And do we have a staff presentation for this? Fairly uh, straightforward. Yes, uh, Your Worship. So page... Uh, 107, I believe it is. So, since council passed the financial plan on uh, April 10th, now it's time to do the property tax rate bylaw. So that's what this is: introduction of that bylaw. Um, the rates have been submitted as a supplemental on the yellow sheets. 
Um, I didn't. I was waiting for some information from BC Assessment that I received late on Friday. Um, so that's the rates that would be inserted into the bylaw are on page nine of the yellow pages. Um, same table as we normally insert. Of course, the rates are different because the amount of revenue we're requesting is different, and uh, because the assessments have changed. So the the, the uh, previous year's bylaws attached in the uh, pages five through to seven of the supplemental package, the yellow pages, so that if you were looking at the rates, uh, page seven is the 2016 rates, and page nine is the uh, 2017 rates. Um, for example, municipal residential, you'll see in 2016 the rate was 2.92, and in 2017 it's 2.85. That doesn't mean the taxes are going down. That means that's the rate that it needs to be to get us to our budgeted amount of revenue, which worked out to be a 5.58-ish, 5 5.59 um, change from the previous year. So that the rates just become what they are based on what the assessment numbers come out at and what the revenue is that we need. So so that's uh, that's the report. The bylaws is the, the same bylaw presentation as it has been in, in previous years. So we're just looking for the uh, recommendation as noted that we have uh, that we have second and first, second and third readings this evening. Okay, questions for staff. Councillor Casper. Um, um, I'll move first reading. Okay, move first reading by Councillor Casper, seconded by Councillor Ray. Any questions on first reading? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried unanimously. Move second reading by Councillor Ray, seconded by Councillor Berger. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed? Third reading by Councillor second. Pearson and seconded by Councillor Casper. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, thank you. Our next item up is 12.1, Council Liaison Regional and Community Organizations. So what staff did is every year we have a long lengthy list of various liaison appointments and what um, staff did was go through and notify or try to contact the various groups just to see if the group is still active, if it's meeting, and how did we become a council liaison is the big question to some of these groups and some of them have evolved over time um, and you sort of see the full listing there and some groups have have come and gone some of them may be by their particular bylaw and so there's sort of a summary here um, that has been formed um, and then some of the groups have gotten back to staff as you see in the report and are looking for council members to be involved. And often it's the case of the ability to share information back and forth, what's happening at council, what's happening within their organization, and how can everyone work together and support one another. So um, there's sort of um, the big listing here and just in some cases perhaps why there's no response or there's just no, some of them just aren't active anymore. Um, yes, so any questions or comments from Council? And of course, uh, there was a request from one, two, three, four, six different groups here uh, looking for Councillor interest to attend. Councillor Loggins. Thank you. Um, I am unable to pull it up because my system's not working, but I'm wondering if there are dates assigned to those. Thank you. No, we don't um, have the dates. Because I pulled out sort of of the um, family court committee because I have a standing meeting at the exact same time as those meetings. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't able to make many of them. Um, however, if, like, if I would suggest one of us is able, who is able to, to attend does because it is very um, informative and they have amazing guest speakers um, from all over the region. Um, I think Councillor Ray has done her time there, but, <laughs> but she can probably speak to how important that is as well. Um, I've sat on it as well. Yeah, yeah. and I'm happy to, I just want to let everyone know that I am happy to 
um, report back based on like emails that I'm receiving and correspondence that I'm receiving, but I'm not going to be able to give a full report on those activities. I think what might be helpful here, because that's part of the challenge, is when does the group meet and when can you actually go, because things do change. Is it possible, um, I don't want to keep dragging this out, but that the next meeting it comes back to us with date and time? Because it's to, unless you know, like right, we just don't know when they're actually meeting. And they might have changed, some of them change meeting times year to year because the membership changes and then that's where going even on previous information may not be correct for a decision. Is council comfortable with that? If we just defer, push this to the next meeting and we get that information. What I would like here, um, there is part of a recommendation though that I'm appointed to the South Nation MOU Working Group, Primary Health Care Working Group, Tumuk Treaty Advisory Committee. Um, however, we also have um, Councillor Parkinson and Loggins are also part of the MOU Working Group and Councillor Parkinson is my al alternate on the Tumuk Treaty Advisory Group. So I'm comfortable with the first part, but I think the second part, we could move that tonight and that's, because I know when they meet. <laughs> okay, Councillor Pearson. I don't mind uh, microphone. I don't mind volunteering. Like, I mean, obviously, Alita's or that group is looking for something. I say to Alita, uh, Souk Regional Historical Society. I wouldn't mind being involved there, so I would put my name forward to volunteer. To, okay, to that's a, usually it's an evening at seven. Yep. yep. Um, it's I can't remember if it's Wednesday or Thursday. It was, though. Yeah, it, as long as I can get the information from my name. I mean, the only nights that got conflict for me are usually our council nights. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then, so we can also then make that motion. It's usually a seven o'clock meeting once a month because I was on it okay. previously and it, it is a Wednesday or a Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So we can add that. Second. Okay. Be a point. So this motion as it's being presented is um, the groups for myself and Councillor Pearson to the Sioux Region Historical Society. And then uh, what about the Councillor Loggins? Are you still wanting to be on the South Nation MOU Working Group? Okay, so if we just need to amend this then, um, put Councillor Loggins to be appointed to the South Nation MOU Working Group. And then we also need to add Councillor Parkinson to both the South Nation MOU Working Group and Tamuk Treaty Advisory Committee. Because we might as well just do this all mm -hmm. in one motion. So is the mover and the seconder mm -hmm. content with all the added? Okay. Was there anything else at this moment that Council like, that is out, Councillor Loggins. I'm still happy to be the SRTA um, appointment. For CERTA? Yes. Okay. So we'll add that in for Councillor Loggins. Councillor Loggins be appointed to the South Nation MOU Working Group and CERTA. So you could probably just, um, okay. okay. Councillor um, Ray? Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, Your Worship, it doesn't show on the list. It's on the attached document. So, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood. I, I thought we were just doing the ones that were listed here. Well, these were the ones that came back with wanting a council liaison. council liaison, but I think in this case, because Councillor Loggins is already involved, she's aware that they would like a continued liaison. So if there's other ones that you may have been on that you would like to see going forward, it's up to councillors uh, because some groups didn't respond. 
and some did. So we're going on what did, but Councillor Loggins is, is putting her name forward because she's already done work with that group. So if there is anything, and some just don't exist anymore. Well, if I, if I may, I'm, I, yeah, I'm not aware. I, I didn't ask in terms of the committees that I sat on, um, such as the Sioux Community Association. Um, they just didn't respond to the staff request. So I, I guess my question then is, are we going to make the assumption then that if we're already sitting on a committee, that will continue to sit on that committee? No, it's a one-year appointment, so that's why if you were... Okay, then I'll, then I'll continue with the Sioux Community Association making the assumption that they still would still like... That they still, still want, want you as an appointment, I think. <laughs> yeah, not to be exactly. It's just, it depends on what community... You might have had communication with the group outside of what staff had with an organization as well. And I should bring up that the age-friendly community, the Souk Region Community Health Network age-friendly community did approach me looking for a council liaison to that one as well. That meets once a week, or pardon me, once a month. Second Wednesday of the month at 9.30 in the morning. No, I just looked over this way, so they made they made that comment to me directly, so that's why sometimes this is a staff outreach. You may have council outreach as well. well. You know, I will do it because I was the senior rep some time ago. But uh, it's just your microphone. Would you like to? The only time you wouldn't be able to go is if I'm unavailable to attend a CRD appointment. Then you wouldn't be able to attend because then that was my why I couldn't go to it either. Okay, so on counts to the Souk Region Community Health Network Search and H Friendly Committee. And, and, and I just know that it's 9.30, second Wednesday of each month. But what our staff can do following this motion is just confirm where they meet. Is there anything else? So this is just a one-year appointment for this year. And on those other ones that have already come forward, we'll just get clarity as to the time and location. I believe um, the chamber, for example, meets Tuesday. They couldn't attend our volunteer recognition ceremony last week so because they meet at the same time. So I know it's a Tuesday at 7 and there's a conflict there. So. Okay, so that is our full motion for this moment. Any further additions or deletions? That's been moved and seconded already. So all those in favor? Oppose, motion's carried. And we'll just have staff come back with date and time at the next meeting on the others. Okay? Great. Okay, thank you. Our next is Communities in Bloom. And I was trying to find the minutes, but there is an outstanding motion from November 14th of last year that staff were to report back to council on 2017 Community in Bloom's participation. But I don't recall receiving the staff report. And then there's been no funding in our budget that's been approved. So. <laughs> Is this particular request under the friends participants, is this just for us to maintain our status then? Okay, no participation. Okay. The downside to not participating is that when you start to get momentum growing within the community, then there's nothing. And then it's also our Canada 150 celebration. Um, so that's, but there are some fees, um, in addition to this fee, there are some monies that would need to be um, allocated towards participating in the program. It's maybe around $5,000 or so, if not a little bit more. Last year there was the whole, um, usually there's a book that, profile book that was produced by staff and last year um, our staff just didn't have the capacity to do it so it was contracted out 
there's a reception for judges, there's hotel expenditures and the like. So I think it was around $7,500, maybe? I'm guessing, I can't remember. Um, staff, Mr. Blackall? Yes, uh, Your Worship. I um, may defer to our deputy corporate officer on this, but I think the budget was around $3,000. It was oh, okay, 3000 yeah. okay. And um, it isn't in, there isn't an amount in, as you've stated, for the 2017 budget, but then it's back in for 2018 and 2020, because I, I think the thoughts of the um, uh, of the corporate officer, former corporate officer, was that it would be done, could be done on a cyclical yeah, five, basis five. Okay. at that time. So it is in the financial plan for 2018 participation, mm -hmm. and there's funds allocated. Uh, yes, that's correct, but I guess the, um, the, the report, the staff report is, is um, asking for, on page um, 11 of the supplemental package. Oh, okay. Is that uh, council direct staff to register for the 2017 Communities in Bloom under the Friends Participation category, which is a lesser expensive category? Um, I think I'll, I'll hand it over right now just to our deputy corporate officer for her to um, add any other comments. Okay. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so it, it's it's four thirty seven fifty right now to to maintain this status here of the friends participation category. If we were to participate, it would actually be eight seventy five plus your membership, which is around five hundred. Um, and then any expenses incurred on top of that for the um, event itself. Okay, so this is the staff report then that from the November motion. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, okay, so I think that was the discussion last year. Councillor Casper? Um, I'll move the recommendation, and, and that'll just keep the ball rolling. Second. Yep. Okay, that's been moved by Councillor Casper and seconded by Councillor Pearson. So for clarity, we will be holding our status but not participating in 2017 and look to participate in 2018. And I think um, as we reach the end of this year, then planning for communities in bloom would have to start pretty actively so it's not a scramble at the end. We may need to form a task force to take it on next year or something of that nature. Okay, all those in favor, please? Opposed, motion's carried. Okay, item 12.3 is our statutory and permissive tax exemption policy. Um, staff report, please. Mr. Blackhall, are you presenting on this? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, so the uh, tax, <coughs> permissive tax exemption is a 10-year, as it stands right now, is a 10-year exemption. So it's coming up to the end of the 10 years. So applications would be, uh, it, staff have put together a, a t suggested timeline, which is on the second page of the staff report. Um, so we we'll go through that, but really we're looking for a few things. Is one is we'd like to post that timeline so people are aware of when they should be um, applying, that they're aware that it does need to be applied for this year. Um, also to um, to get council direction for us to amend the community grant policy. If you remember, that came forward just recently. Mm -hmm. However, I think it, it when it came forward, it took out part that used to be in there, which was have you received a permissive tax exemption and if so, how much? So I think that's just to amend that policy to get that put back in there. Um, and then part C of the recommendation is, uh, is any directions regarding any change. For example, um, we've had instance, instances where um, an applicant has changed, they've moved out of a location, you know, that kind of stuff we need to know about and we need to have some um, provision actually in, in the by law that lets them know they need to let us know that we can't be going and checking up on them every year. Um, so they need to come to us for that. Also uh, more like that in, in item two, C2 is, um, you know, that any language that's in here has to be consistent with, that, with everything else we're doing, that's all. And then uh, staff have included some other examples from, from other municipalities. If, if there was any, any other changes that um, council wanted to add, um, for example, 
think in the staff report um, on page uh, on the second page just under the timeline table it's noted that city of Victoria and city of Parksville um, have a f have an evaluation category and a cap based on the budgeted property tax revenues that, that sort of thing so if council had any other you know thoughts if they want us to be amending the policy now's the time to do it otherwise it, you know we've included what how the policy is right now and uh, so we're just looking really on uh, direction on the recommendations that are in the report mm -hmm. councillor casper then pearson so so um where are we in the uh, 10 year cycle yeah. so, uh, uh through your worship to councillor casper this is the last year of the mm -hmm. 10 year cycle so the next year 2018 would be the first year of the next if council chooses 10 years it doesn't have to be 10 years 10 years is the maximum so that's another thing that we'll be needing your direction on well well i'm a person i'm going to support the 10 years because the way it used to be here before the 10 years was brought in every group had to apply annually every year every year and it just became such a burden for everybody and so i don't think we've had problems and as a matter of fact um, I, I think we've all been pretty much on top of some changes because uh, for Knox Church, for example, um, it mm -hmm. became a rental and then it no longer provided that same service Correct. that got the exemption for. So, you know, the, uh, the changes were made, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you were here then. Yep, uh, through your worship to Councillor Casper. <laughs> um, any, I, you know, it's a small town, so we're going to eventually hear these things. It'd be nice to hear about it in the same year um, so we can take action um, regarding if there's any changes we need to make from a property tax matter, but we definitely um, do hear about them. So, Councillor Pearson? Yeah, I'll, I'll move the recommended action that we post uh, for the first one to post the timeline as pre presented for 10 years uh, starting in 2018 because it says it started by law was 338 was adopted in 2007 so this is ended this year is that the way you've presented that uh, yes uh, through your worship to Councillor Pearson feel um, really the timeline in um, the second page of the report mm -hmm. is is kind of I guess what we're looking for is is your Yep. direction on that and yes that was a 10-year bylaw at first perfect so okay. i'll move that recommended action for for a i don't know if you want to break it into three pieces i think we can do it as a a block let's test it do it as a block with the 10 years being the being the the direction i'll move there. the recommended action for a b and c okay is there a seconder right. seconded by councillor casper and then we know that it's going to be 10 years are there any changes amendments comments or questions in regards to all these items councillor ray uh, yes uh your work I'm, I'm just wondering because as it is now you know things are fairly uh small and there isn't that many tax exemptions and and our director of finance has been around for a while i'm just wondering you know through the course of 10 years is there something we might want in the policy where somebody has to just confirm that they still want it so that we're not going, because I just recall when the Salvation Army uh, pulled out of that retail space, um, staff were, were trying to get ahead of it, and I, and I kind of think it should be the other way around. If they want the tax exemption, then all they have to do, they don't have to apply, they just have to confirm in writing, or we have a form or something that takes the onus off of staff. Okay. Is That's, there a response from staff on that? Yes, um, through your worship to uh, Councillor Ray. That's exactly the one uh, we had a problem with, and we mm -hmm. did have an issue chasing that down because they're, of course, going to love to keep getting a tax. Mm -hmm. The owner, I mean, of the, the it the wasn't building. Salvation Army, it was the, the owner of the, the um, retail space. Um, and uh, we were, we d eventually did take care of it. Um, I think it'd be, I think, something to think about of, of getting an annual reporting from these, just to say we're still around, yes, we'd still... Um, appreciate receiving the no, we haven't had any changes to our business or operations that kind of a thing so if I, can just follow up I think what I'm thinking about is just something that's administrative something that staff uh, collect so that it's not coming back to council that's all yep. I was looking for yep exactly um, to um, our deputy approving officer please 
Um, yeah, just to um, thank you, Your Worship, just to sort of add to that, that's sort of what, where we're kind of going with the other considerations. There's an annual application, so they would still have to apply annually, even, even though the bylaw itself may be 10 years, that at least we're getting the information, the updated information, if there is um, a chance of getting updated information from them on a yearly basis. Councillor Pearson? Seems like we're complicating something again. Yeah. Um, the uh, so what are you going to do if they don't send it in? That's what I always ask. You're going to put a put a, something in place and they don't send it in, and we're going to tax them. Yeah. Exactly. So no, I don't. I'm, I don't support that amendment, and I made the original motion. Let's uh, withdraw it then. It's not unless someone wants to move it. Okay, Councillor Berger. Yes, thank you. Um, my questions were quite similar to. Um, what was just stated by staff. If you go to the bottom of that second page where it has the report and the timeline, um, staff are asking for our input on evaluation categories, possible percentage ca um, cap, as well as the 10 years which we've done. I hear what Councillor Pearson is saying is, you know, looking at the flip side of it, what if they don't apply? But I feel that it's probably important for staff to get an annual update as to where these businesses are. So maybe changing the word application and just asking for an annual update so annually we can get where are they located such as if they've moved right and we don't know about it so um, I don't know maybe just the word application hit Councillor Pearson the wrong way but I do think it is important that staff have a yearly update as to where these businesses are located but they're not they're not businesses or sorry these it's exemptions so like the Salvation Army is entitled to an exemption if let's say the community association sells the ball field or you know what I mean like rather than us be reactive there's a proactive update annually I think that correct me if I'm wrong I think that's the intention that staff was trying to go for in that bullet I'll put it back on staff's hands but I'm just trying to interpret it what they're asking us to do yep through your worship to Councillor Berger that's that's what the intention was is to capture the issues like we had with the Salvation Army. It wasn't Salvation Army's fault. It was the, really the landlord's fault. It's, it's mm -hmm. capturing the cases where uh, people aren't informing us that the status has changed and we don't find out in time to correct it for taxes for the year. So. Okay. Um, Councillor Pearson? How many tax exemptions do we have? There's a list there. Yeah. I think. I, 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 don't know offhand, but it's probably tw more than 20, less than 40, somewhere in that neighborhood. <laughs> I know it wasn't um, very many. There's a number. Somewhere. Most of their churches, they're, you know, unless yeah. the church has moved and all of a sudden running a business, you know, there's not likely. There's, there's, there's a couple of land pieces. There's land parcels. Yeah. Just trying to, what we're, I think what counts, what I'm hearing is what council's striving to do is, is to make this, um, just a smooth process that doesn't have a lot of additional administrative work to it. So does this implementing an annual update form while keeping the 10-year bylaw? Is that capturing um, Kevin, Mr. Councillor Pearson? <laughs> Thank you, call me Kevin. Um, I'm <laughs> If staff's comfortable with it, it just seems like we're overcomplicating it. Yeah. We have a great process. It hasn't. We haven't had anything go wrong, save one thing in the last ten years. It pretty easy. It's been pretty easy to manage. I want to speak to. That's what I'm saying. We had one, and it was a landlord issue. It wasn't the society that was that was there. It was a landlord issue, right? So, mm -hmm. and eventually, he has to pay his taxes anyways, right? Yep. We have a pretty fail-safe system in place for collecting taxes. Yep, uh, through uh, your worship to Councillor Pearson. Um, that really is the only one we've had an issue with. Um, we don't see a whole lot of those requests come around, but we do get them from time to time. And we could build something into that particular type of application so that um, it's just in that type. I, I can't see, obviously, obviously this isn't going to be an issue for 99% of the ones that we're dealing with, so I'd be comfortable from a staff perspective and not even having that in there and that we can manage it from a, a staff level. Okay, so strike it out. Strike out the amendment. Okay, then we're back to what was moved and seconded. That's in there regarding, um, it's, it's up, this is item C. I think that was in item A. Yeah. 
Okay. Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you very much, and thank you, staff. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at item 14, new business. I don't believe there's any new business. There's just um, some additional pieces of correspondence. Your Worship. Is there new business? Sorry, yes. there, there is an item under 13.1, reports for information. Oh, pardon me, I missed that. Okay, reports for information. The anti-bullying and harassment policy. Okay, so looking, is there a staff report on this? Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Um, so we've had our policy updated uh, while we've had a, a, a redo of the policy, actually. We've had some training recently, and it's it's a, sort of a fresh look policy, and we're just bringing it forward um, so you can review it. And if you had any comments or any suggestions, we obviously heard a couple of typos. We'll take care of those. Um, but any, anything else um, council would like to comment on is fine, and we'll take that. Okay. What um, are there... We had a policy in the past, and now this is a new revised one. What is What are some of the elements that have changed? Right. Yeah, I think um, I will let our fire chief handle that, because I think he was involved. Uh, Your Worship and Council, I can comment on that, since I was involved in delivering some of the training recently and sat in through the training. so. Some of the key things I noted uh, as delivering the training is the actual um, pr uh, process and procedure. So there's actually an informal uh, process that's outlined in the actual policy. It's uh, outlining that um, parties that are having some sort of conflict are directed to try and deal with it uh, with themselves first. And then from uh, that step, there's an actual mediation process. And then it goes into a formal process, which uh, involves um, investigative and uh, an actual form, a reporting form that uh, was never in place in the past. So that form uh, has the method of uh, uh, maintaining confidentiality and some form of uh, anonymity. And uh, the CAO has the right to assign uh, an investigator to support the actual process and also the right to investigate even if uh, they deem that uh, there isn't a full investigation necessary. These, those are the, some of the key uh, components on it. Um, and I would note that the uh, uh, fire department and the volunteers have done this training as well in advance of this uh, policy amendment. Okay, Councillor Ray, then Pearson. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I guess my, my challenge is, is when we have a policy and it has changes to it, without the tracking piece to it, I find it very hard. And so I don't feel comfortable, um, you know, endorsing a changed policy. Um, if we could put this off to have the document come back uh, outlining the tracking because you know taking words out and you know this, this um, um, now it doesn't say that it was amended but I'm sure we amended this this uh, mm -hmm. policy in my last term and and I wasn't here in May of tw uh, 2011 so I'm just a little concerned Okay, um, just a response from staff. Um, yep. uh, through your worship to Councillor Ray. I, it, I understand the policy was last amended in 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I believe from what I remember reading the last policy and being involved in a bit of the training on this one is that it's quite a different, it, it would be quite a, a, the track changes will look quite um, onerous, but we can certainly do that and bring it back again. Mm -hmm. Okay, to our deputy corporate officer. Um, yes, thank you, Your Worship. I believe the intent of tonight is not to endorse the policy, but just to receive it for information, and it will probably come back to you an, at another date, um, just so that, that you have this um, in your files for now and you can mull it over. Okay, so this is something we can receive and give more atten time and attention to and uh, and then receive it a later date. Uh, Councillor Pearson? You know, and that was going to be my question because it was just a recommendation, a, a report to receive for information was the recommendation. And so I took it that we were to sort of peruse this and it was going to come back. That's the way, the way I read the agenda tonight. So um, 
the one question I have, and I'm not sure, is it through the through your chair to to Mr. Blackwell, our CEO, the the one it's a very standard kind of approach to anti-harassment bullying. Um, what I the one thing I don't see is the CAO seems to be responsible for everything. Um, what happens is if it's the CAO that's named. I guess that's the one piece that I saw that was a little different in here. Right? So um, through your worship, it, to Councillor Pearson, it would be then the mayor. Um, yeah, and that should be in here. I believe it was. I, 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 I saw that brief mention to it, but I was just because yeah. everything was led by the CAO, right? And, and just there were several paragraphs that went down. Okay, yeah. So that was all. That was the only question. So I'll move uh, recommended action uh, received for information. It's been moved to receive by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Casper. Yes, go ahead. So, so, so I did my own tracking, and so um, we uh, the old policy was eight pages long and this one is uh, 16. Um, there's actually a lot more detail um, and more listing of items and what is um, an offense or, or what, what are the pro problem areas so that it's clearly understood. Um, most of that wasn't in the original policy. There wasn't as much detail. So um, actually I was prepared to actually adopt it and amend the old one because I was more than satisfied with it. But we've got two spelling mistakes to fix. <laughs> yeah, through your worship to uh, Councillor Casper, we'll yeah. we'll um, tidy it up first and bring it back, and and, and if possible, add the, the tracking changes, so you can see what did change. And really, the um, the changes are coming from a lot of stuff that's changed requirements from WorkSafe BC. So that's that's why I think the policy is quite different than it was before. Okay, so there's something in here that. I wonder a bit about it's item five application of the policy the second part of that says or reads this policy applies to bullying and harassment that is work related whether it occurs at the workplace itself and includes without limitation job related travel and job related social functions so where I wonder about that is Staff and council travel to conferences like the UBCM, FCM, and this then is to cover off any incident that occurs. So you can be at an airport, a member of the public says something inappropriate to you while you're standing in line waiting for whatever, and this policy applies. It's like how can we cover that scope? or at UBCM receptions or any sort of staff or social function, there's alcohol and people start to behave inappropriately, are then outside where there could be, I think of a place like Whistler, for example, numerous clubs, activities, and people <coughs> doing this or that, person has to travel from the function back to their hotel and is subject to whatever on the way, how can we possibly deal with a scope like that? And I'm raising this now because it's something that there was actually a UBCM resolution that came up at the last convention about the UBCM adopting a code of conduct at its conference uh, because people attending the conference had been subjected to uh, harassment of some nature that occurred on the street. So how when I think of how, okay, if it's in chambers or within the district office, but as you start to broaden that scope, how can we address it in a way that's reasonable? Like travel in itself, when you think of how many places. The scope, <laughs> the scope comes in when it's when it's job related. If it's a specific incident, it'll be written off as an incident unrelated to the work. The like, job relates is job related travel and that, job related social function. But it also, the harassment and the bullying has to be job related. So if somebody followed you from Souk and went I'm to I'm not saying that, okay, so, so some. So it has to be related. This policy covers us in the course of employment or association with the district. Outside of that, you can't control the public. Like you say in the airport, if you're harassed or bullied in the airport, that's an incident that would be different than work-related. Even though you're traveling for... Yeah, you'd be covered by WorkSafe BC. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, you would be. But you wouldn't be covered, you wouldn't be covered, but 
in a harassment in a bullying suit if somebody just said, hey, get out of the way, get out of the way, get out of the way, right? Well, I mean, let's say you're waiting in line and, you know, people are impatient, they're coming off of flights and you're standing there just blah, 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 and I hey, what, and says something to you and you're there. If you could prove okay. Okay, so that's what I wanted to be sure is that, okay, things happen that are unfortunate that could just happen because of the situation and, and do we then have to investigate because someone made an unkind <coughs> remark while the person happened to be going from a social event back to their hotel in the street and some unkind or uncouth, unsavory comment that was racist, derogatory, sexist, any of that was said, is that our policy? Councillor Ray. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The policy actually reflects that it, it is by any council member, district office, employer, or volunteer. It's not directed to the public. But there was a comment, and I just looked at earlier. Not, not in the application of the policy okay. as it relates to job. about social events. But there is social events. So this, what my understanding would be from this policy, is if we all go to UBCM, it's about our behavior towards one another, whether you're a counselor, a district officer, an employee, or a volunteer. This doesn't talk about traveling in the general public. This is about Or us. the general public. Okay, just somewhere I read here about... <coughs> the public though being defined now I can't find it so that's why I'm like wait a second when I catch these two together I mean that would just be impossible it, it would it's an unfair scope to, it, it would just be too challenging to meet okay yeah I just sorry um, your worship I just like to add on the next page 5.0.2 um, is something else to consider that is where district staff are being mm -hmm. bullied and that's harassed by non district employees so mm -hmm. that yeah, there's so still an obligation under WorkSafe to respond oh, yeah, like but that's what okay that's where I read it and I saw it in, and it was in the same one district staff are being bullied by non-district employees such as a contractor consultant so you're at a trade show you're at a UBCM and there's a trade show and a contractor Microphone. So say you were down at, say you were doing it the uh, the sh a rotary auction. Somebody came down there and said, "You do my development. You do my development." You, and wouldn't leave you. We'd have to investigate that. That's directly related to your job. Okay. But in travel, when you get to the broader scope, if it was a just an isolated incident, it'd be treated by the the rules of the law. Okay. Okay. So okay. It has to be job related. That's what the definition. Okay. I'm just looking at that. It's just when you read the two together, I, I just read it a different way. So I think when this comes back, I, I, I can hear from staff that there has been some workshops and training. Uh, there may, it may make sense that council receive a more robust workshop on our own so that we understand exactly what the policy is that we're being asked to adopt, its implications, and just have some case examples on where it applies. You know, I just, I've seen Poor, and I just this resonates a bit with me because I've seen poor behavior at these conferences, and they're out in the street by members of the public and delegates, and you know just you could unfortunately, as I was, been walking right through it on your way back to the hotel, and you see and witness this, and then now we have to deal with that. Like it would be, it can happen, right? So okay. Good to know. All right, so we're receiving this for information. All those in favor, oppose, motions carried. Okay, item 15.1, there are some emails that have come back from the South Island Sea Kayakers. Um, there's several actually, and there was also, I received another one on the weekend um, of similar form. And it's regarding uh, an unfortunate situation that um, that people are experiencing that whiff and spit while using and enjoying that area. Councillor Loggins. I have a question about these email correspondence because um, we seem to have just received one side of the story and that side was asking that 
that council does not remove parking for kayakers or or discontinue um, them to be able to use that space to park. I have not seen any requests. Um, maybe I've missed something, but I was just kind of wondering why th these were here. Yeah, and that's where there is a line, like if there's formal consideration of any changes, because I haven't been approached by anyone either to say, um, nobody has called my office and said that kayakers shouldn't park at the spit. Like, in fact, it's unfortunate that this is happening because I wasn't aware that there was a problem with parking at this. I know the park itself is very popular and it can get busy. And, uh, and that's where sometimes the Harbor House opens up there a lot to accommodate additional traffic or you see people, but I wasn't ever aware. It's unfortunate that this is happening. It's something I'm not aware of. Um, I don't know, I, we've never had a delegation of anyone coming forward asking us to prohibit kayaks off the spit, but some feedback from staff perhaps, Mr. Howitt? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, from a staff level, we've had uh, several complaints by phone. We've actually had the RCMP involved as well. What seems to be happening or what appears to be happening is people who are parking in Whiff and Spit and go kayaking, they're gone for several hours. And it's the other people who enjoy the park that are getting upset uh, that these people are there for that amount of time. It got to the point where they were leaving messages on cars and securing the messages on the car with rocks, etc. Oh. So that's what that's what's bringing the RCMP into play. Um, staff and myself are, have a meeting. I believe it is this Wednesday or Thursday uh, with some folk down there, including the RCMP, to see if there's something that we can do. Uh, maybe with some signage. We don't want to prohibit anything, but maybe no. we need to go down and have a look and, and sort of experience what's happening, and then. Uh, perhaps from that we can bring something back to council if we can determine exactly what's happening to who and why. But I mean the spit's there. I mean I've been there for hours at a time. You walk to the end, you have a picnic, read a book. You'd be there for hours depending on the day. Like I wouldn't want to see anyone have a time limit. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate that this is happening. So, um, okay. Councillor Berger, were you going to add something? No, I, sh I share your I share your um, your same point of view. I mean, I've gone there quite frequently to, to walk my dog, and it, to me, it sounds like this is quite possibly just an isolated incident that had happened. But all the emails that we've received talk about this one particular incident. Um, the kayakers group say that they go every three months or something, so it doesn't seem like to me it it's unfortunate that this has happened. I would hope that our residents can you know, be kind and, and recognize that people are utilizing the park. I, I agree with you. I would hate to see any restrictions put on any uh, parking or use of the spit. Councillor Casper? Well, I went down there this afternoon, and um, the only thing I would suggest is that um, if somebody brought in kayaks on a trailer, there's nowhere for them to park. And so that could create a problem. Um, the only thing I'm concerned about is that um, it's very uh, limited getting in and out of that parking area. And it looks like there's been people parking on the side. And you'll see that when you go down there tomorrow. Um, there, there is no room to expand a parking there. And uh, the reason why I got blacktop and lined was to actually get some semblance of order so that people can share the parking. You know, that's why the lines were painted and it was mapped out. And, and it's sad, you know, I would just hope that people would try to get along, you know, and it, it's just a sad commentary. Yeah. Mr. Howell? Your Worship, through to uh, Councillor Casper. We were kicking around, sorry, we were throwing around some ideas from a staff level, and we we are going to be meeting with the adjacent property owner to see if we can procure a little more parking. Uh, we don't know how that's going to go, but we've uh, made contact with her, and we're going to be meeting with her too. But I was also thinking about some sort of signage down there, asking people to appreciate that it, the Wolf and Spit Park is for all, and you know have an appreciation for everybody else's rights. Uh, I don't. I don't know what else to do until we get down there and assess it. So, okay. So you'll be coming back with a. Well, 
um, another report at, at some time in the near future then. Okay. So at this time then, I, I motion to receive, please. Um, can someone move that? Move it. Moved by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Loggins. Any further discussion? All those in favour? Opposed? Motions carried. Okay, so we have um, correspondence items. Item 16, there is quite a lengthy list of information. Um, I'm just going to pull this up here. We'll see a few letters that were in response at the primary health working group. I just want to see if it's in this batch or not. From the Minister of oh, it's Health? It's one of the last ones. Oh, yes, it is from Minister Lake. And it was just about... Um, you know, our how I wanted to know how Souk's rural status, because Souk had rural status at one point and then it was removed. And so, how is the rural status determined? How can you appeal it and the like? So, then his letter to me was basically just sending me back. I keep kind of going in this circular reference. And then I sent another letter to um, the group that he referenced also replied back to me and it was a very sort of no they're, they've looked at it and it's done and it's closed for this year that was the one from the BC Joint Standing Committee on Rural Issues that they've already made their determination and so now I'm just trying to get into what that process is and how it's all defined and what that looks like so that's one piece that I'm sort of delving into um, the communities that have, and it just doesn't make sense to me because when I look at who has rural status, how is it that they're eligible when we're not? When you, when it's not, if I was initially told it's distance and our proximity to other centers, but if that's the case, then why is Lady Smith Duncan, Shemaine is, why do they all have this status and we don't when they, when you look, so there has to be more to it. So it's just, uh, we start sending out letters just to see what comes, and that's what I've been receiving back. Sorry. Councillor Loggins? Um, this is one of the hashtags I think we need to add to the divided by 14. Add, like, not a new hashtag. Or tag them or something. How many yeah. letters on <laughs> regarding the improvements to health services have I sent? Exactly. There's some, and it... Um, and if it's the case where we can't get rural status, then fine, we are under service, though. Or in the case of services moving, if, you're, if they use Victoria General, well, if they relocate to Royal Jubilee, then how does that impact? And it's, it would be, fun, you know, it's still the divided by highway piece exists, but it's also the services that exist in the core are overwhelmingly busy. So it's still not... Still not good enough, so we just keep going. Councillor Casper, you had a suggestion? Well, I, was just, I was just going to say, um, you know, there is a reference that, that a, a joint um, or a the committee, joints. right, a yeah. committee is actually going to be, um, has been appointed to review the annual RSA point assessment system. No changes will be made until the completion of this review. So, so my my question I'd be asking is, okay, what is the process for the review mm -hmm. and the timelines? You, you know, yeah. it'd be good to know what their timelines are because it's pretty open-ended here and perhaps they don't know. But a committee has been appointed. Is you're referring to, well, it's yeah. the last paragraph. Yeah, and that refers to the earlier letter yes. that I got. So a subcommittee has been appointed yeah. to review. Well, they are, and this is where I did get a, I got a letter back mm -hmm. from the chair, co-chair of the Standing Committee on Rural Issues. Mm -hmm. They've received it, they're aware, and our desire to have it reinstated. <coughs> They've undertaken a review. And then there's a subcommittee. That's been appointed. Yeah. So that's where, okay, so I'm going to be receiving this, and then there's no change to the point system. The current system are points for fiscal 2718. So anyway, it's. So, so I'll be sending another letter. Yeah. <laughs> I 
that's just what's going to happen. And this is the second one, sorry, Councillor Ray, because I, this is the second one that I sent to the Minister of Health because the first letter I got back to him was just, thank you for your letter. I'm like, yeah, but you haven't answered my question. And so now when the new Minister of Health is in place, I know he's retiring, then we'll be actively pursuing this again. Councillor Ray? Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Just a comment, and I don't know if it's been discussed before, but I think, um, you know, there's a difference between how far you are from somewhere and how long it actually takes you to drive. Mm -hmm. So like if you're from the outlying areas outside of, uh, you never talk about how far somewhere is, you always talk about how long it takes you to get there. Yeah. And I think that's part that may be missing in their point system is, is that they're not recognizing that even though it's 19 kilometers or within the, the kilometers, um, it actually takes us longer to drive because I can actually get from Parksville that has a center to the hospital in Nanaimo quicker than I can get from Soup, driving the speed limit, to Helmkin. And I'm not even at the hospital yet. So I, I think that's the imbalance um, that I don't think that they take into account is this, just the, the distance doesn't necessarily mean you can get there quicker. No, that's a very good point. And the other one is transit service, yes. which is just, to get to Victoria, it's very, it's a very long, that and even handy dart for that yeah. matter. But I think in terms of the transit approach. system, I mean, if you're comparing somewhere like Parksville to Nanaimo, there's not really much of a transit system. Um, but, you know, they do get quick, they can get there quicker to the Nanaimo hospital than we yeah. can get to uh, Victoria. Councillor Loggins? Um, the other piece is that we would be the closest location for Port Renfrew and everyone in between. So yeah. they obviously have that status, but no services either, uh, comparatively. So um, are they expected to drive all that way? Are they expected to go up to Duncan? Or I'm and not quite sure what that's like. I don't know if you've had conversations with um, them. So that's where that. some will travel to Cowichan and Duncan that way. Um, you'll also see in here there's a survey um, because there were so many different media outlets were picking this up and the Sioux Pocket News put together because I said there's some questions and then they put together a survey that received overwhelming responses uh, because I'm just trying to get um, different the feedback and the situation that our residents encounter and, and what I hear a lot from are folks that have moved here are still retaining the services from where they came from. So I have some people that have their, that moved from the lower mainland, but they will actually travel to the lower mainland for those medical appointments and make a little trip of it and then return here because there's no services and people up island even all over. And even when you look at the youth survey, it was interesting how many youth do access the medical service within the high school when it's offered, but they do have a family doctor, not in Souk, but in another area, because then you would have to probably take a day off school to go to that. So it's interesting how that is. But yeah, it was um, a, a great survey, great feedback. And I continually get phone calls and it's, it's the second or even actually it's the top reason why people phone me is our medical services is actually surpassing the highway, but the two are tied in together. Councillor Berger? Yes, I just was going to ask a question. Um, through your working group that you're a part of, has there been discussion about how um, even within, I, they might not go by Island Health anymore, I think it's been changed, anyhow, how they distribute services and it's, I, if I look within my own household, I had a daughter who required an x-ray. Um, but I had to take her right downtown to Cook Street because they didn't have the appropriate machine. Mm -hmm. My son just last month had surgery and his surgery was booked out of San Angelo Peninsula. Yeah. So, I mean, it's how they're allocating the services as well throughout the CRD really have an impact on Souk residents when, you know, in the last two months I've been to the San Angelo Peninsula Hospital as well as downtown Cook Street and Gates. Yeah. Well, that's just it. Island Health or VHA or, or has, does view us as a rural entity. They still hold that. It's the province that changed it. Um, and for myself, I know what you mean. When I had my ultrasound, I had to go to Sanish Peninsula Hospital as well. Um, it was supposed to be an island ultrasound, which was in the Save on Foods, and then I got bumped and said, no, you have to go up here now. So what do you do? You go, but not easily. Councillor Ray. 
Uh, just quickly, I'm one of those people that traveled from Souk to Chilliwack for four years to see my doctor. See, and that's a very good story. It's another one to add, but it's, it's an unfortunate situation. So my working group um, will be receiving this this week, and then we always try next steps. And the stakeholders at the table have been um, very insightful in terms of what they bring and who to contact, and then we keep trying different ways. Um, on this note, I do have a notice of motion going to the hospitals and health committees at the CRD to see if that might resonate with the committee about regional, providing regional services out here. And it's a non-traditional way because then it's another way to try it because when I, I can't remember which minister I talked to at one point, he goes, well, you don't qualify for rural, you should access what's in the CRD. So I was like, fine, I'm going to the CRD then to see. So we'll see how that goes. Um, there was other correspondence in, so anyway, that's um, some of the items that are in here and I appreciate the discussion and the assistance on it. There was, um, Mr. Bateman brought forward one on the Salish Sea Trust campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, wondering how, if council wants to consider a motion there. There was also uh, just how we deliver ads and the like through media, uh, request for the pocket news to look at um, doing some advertising with them. Um, there's other bits and pieces in here. So just looking for some further feedback from Council. Councillor Berger? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, touch on the Navy League branch. They're actually asking for yes the um, sponsorship of $40 for a trophy as well as if anybody's available. So I just wanted to pull that one out because it had direct action. Okay, so why don't we pull that one and talk about that. Thanks for raising that. So there was two parts to the Navy League. There is the sponsorship donation and there's also the annual ceremonial review. Now that's on June the 4th when most of us are going to be in Ottawa attending FCM. So I don't know, Councillor Berger, if you're available on that day, be the day after your son's grad ceremony. I believe it. The four, is it the 4th of Saturday? I the 4th is a Sunday. Um, yeah, I can't, unfortunately I can't commit just because I'm not sure what we're doing with my family. Well, that's um, why. But I would like to make the motion to at least sponsor the award. Sorry. Okay, and I think there's two. Do we, sorry to interrupt. Um, through you, maybe to uh, Mr. Blackwell, do we have this within our budget? We seem to do it every year and I'm... Um, where the money would come from. Through your worship to Councillor Berger, um, there is a, uh, there was a line for sponsorships. Yep, there's $2,500 annually for sponsorships. Um, and there's also council contingency. Okay. We spent 1500 from council contingency, but this could come from sponsorship, right? There's two, and there's two different awards on this one. So to have them both come from sponsorship, this has been moved and seconded already. We're just fixing that if, if the mover and seconder are okay with the way the accounts are coming from. Just a, uh, qu just a question. Councilor Ray, yep. Your comment that the um, Saltwater series was from council contingency, I don't think we actually said that. Yeah. I it's supposed to be from Community in Blooms, maybe? I thought it, I thought, um, I wrote down 1500 from council contingency. We should have said sponsorship. That would be the appropriate, but we can fix that, right? Okay, so let's deal with the motion here. I'll call the question then. All those in favor of the trophies? Opposed? So that'll be $80 each, $80 total. Okay. Any other items of correspondence that moved receipt by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Ray? Councillor Loggins? Um, there are several others that I wanted to pull out to discuss. Okay. Um, so I don't know if I would discuss that I would do that now then. <laughs> um, actually, just two. One was the UNESCO Heritage application. Okay. Um, I, I'm not 100% clear if they did want like a letter of support. Um, and I'm curious if anyone else noticed if they did or not. 
but it might be too late for that anyway. That was just a question, actually. There was, um, there is a, a request. Let's see here. As a leader, your support. We're requesting you ask your MLA or MP for their support. Which they've done. That's how it's reading in the letter. It's more. We're requesting you ask your MLA and MP for their support for the designation, and then we were advised that Mr. Garrison has already done this. Perfect, thank you. And then okay. the other one was that uh, SPN be included in the advertising budget, um, and I just wanted to also publicly thank them for spending $288 out of pocket and putting the time and effort into collecting that amazing data for the, the survey, but I'd like to see them including in, included in our advertising budget. Okay, so that will be, that's a bit different. So why don't we deal with, um, I'll deal with the motion that's on the floor first, and then we can move on to that, because that'll change it. So we'll call the question on motion to receive. That was, those were your only pieces of correspondence to discuss. Okay, all those in favor of receipt, opposed, motion's carried. And then Councillor Loggins in terms of SPN advertising. Would you like to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I, I mean, the, I think the survey results prove how many people are um, engaging in that, and that's one of our areas uh, of improvement and what we've been wanting to do um, for our communication strategy, so I think it would be important to include them in that, um, and it's not too expensive, I don't think. Um, and then, so I, I would like to make a motion that we include them in the advertising budget, but then one of my other okay, questions... Okay, we need a... Um, yeah. A first. seconder for that. Is there a seconder from members of council? I'll second the motion. Any discussion? Go ahead, council. Then my discussion Lawrence. on the motion is I'm wondering why council will not support it if they don't feel like they want to or, or if they do feel they want to, then that's great. Go ahead, uh, microphone, please. Well, um, I, I don't think that it's appropriate for us to just single out one particular uh, entity um, or support one. There's a number of blog sites or sites that refer to them as news. And so, you know, you could pick one and, and the next thing you know, we're going to be inundated with others. And... Um, and uh, I, you know, I don't think that we should make a decision like this in isolation to what we're spending in advertising. And I agree, it's important to get the information out. But but I would hope that staff, in 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 their work and effort, would at least prepare um, something as a package, which includes a wide range of how you communicate with the public. I, I'm not necessarily opposed, but I but I think there's a problem in just picking out this one because somebody happens to ask or somebody suggested from from the audience, and and, and I don't operate that way. Um, I'm sorry to say, um, I don't see other publications um, getting supporters to come and ask us to pay them money in advertising. Business is not done that way. All right? That's reality. It's reality in local government. I don't see other municipalities going through it or have even heard of it. And I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but, you know, I just have to operate on what I consider um, standard practice because it's taxpayers' money. But if somebody can bring me a compelling case, and we're going to treat others the same way, and they're all put on the same footing, then so be it. You know, I don't have a problem with that. And, and I appreciate it being brought up, but at the same token, I, I just can't support it right now. I think to answer, it's that um, we do put ads in the West Shore Voice and the Souk News Mirror as well. And there's different ways of defining media um, and there's many different ways but it's the case of how do our residents 
get information on what's happening in town. And so I suppose in that regard, that sort of defines communications in a sense for me. Um, people are using different, everyone, you, some read all of them, some read one or two or none of the above or all of the above. And in terms of engaging or getting messaging out, it's, it is popular and our residents use it for to know what's happening in and around town and I think that is what if I'm not mistaken sort of um, what Councillor Loggins is trying to raise it's a valid point so there is a case there um, I mean th in terms of shedding a light on health services it was the souk mirror I give the credit to for picking it up on the first place and getting it out there that's what led to other media starting to catch on um, it was just it was that simple. That's what started it all uh, and brought it online to CTV Island News and black press all over. So one feeds into the other, but certainly the feedback from the survey that this Pocket News did was also very relevant and is very helpful as well. But we, we do a lot of different things um, to get uh, our message out and engaging the community. So if there was another site that had the same traction and had the same effort and the same physical person sort of appearing that we know who it was. It wasn't just a nameless blog or a nameless face. I would view it differently. But in this case, we know who the editor publisher is and who reads it. So it's just how I view it. Um, and I agree with Councillor Loggins. Councillor Berger? Yes, thank you. Um, I think as we're going through lots of our bylaws and policies, I think this is an area that we probably need to look at. I mean, if we ask anybody at, amongst our peers where they get their news from, the majority of them would say Facebook. And that comes with Souk Issues, Souk Scoop, Vancouver Island, West Shore News, Meanwhile in Souk. I mean, there's so many different avenues that I think that there are out there. And just doing a quick even Google search about online news, there's tons of different ones that come up. So um, as Councillor Casper said, I'm not, opposed, I'm not opposed to it, but I don't believe it should be just a one-off. I think that it would be timely for us to review that policy as well. And we don't have a communications policy. To our staff, please, Mr. Black. Yeah, I was going to add, um, uh, our CAO had been working on a communication strategy, so that might be something you want to see come back and it may help with this discussion. Well, it needs to come forward for discussion. She's done a lot of work on the strategy already. And one point that I raised at our last meeting when we were adopting the budget was at a was to look at a committee of the whole in terms of what pieces, like how are we going, what are staff, council's expectations in learning about what's unrolling in the budget, what are we messaging out? So that might be a time then to have this conversation um, should the motion not pass at this point. We do have a live motion on the floor, so I think it's good to clear that. But I do think communication in general is something we need to have a much broader conversation on. So I do want to see that come forward uh, in the very near future. Because I know that she's done extensive work on the strategy itself, and it, it deserves to have due attention paid to it. Okay. So any further discussion on the motion? I'll call the Councillor Loggins. I just want to add that I hope that it's not personal issues that are getting in the way of including this advertising in the budget because I have heard that from some people. Um, I do hope that it is something, uh, as Councillor Casper Ka mentioned, that would that would stop some councillors from voting against this. But there are no other um, organizations coming forward to ask. There are no other organizations um, who are receiving like blogs, I mean, who are receiving such high response rates and coming to us and asking to be included. Um, it's literally just been one person over the past few years. So um, I don't see why it, it wouldn't be included in the budget. And I do agree that um, in the communication strategy, if I don't know what it looks like at all, but if we could include some sort of social media, it would be a great benefit. And that doesn't need to be in the budget. It does take staff time, um, but it's not part of the budget. It's not part of the funding for it. So we can do that uh, with much uh, less cost as well. Yep. So I just have a question from staff. Is, is there any consideration of a time frame when this matter could come back? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Casper, um, we'd need to uh, do a bit of research and see exactly what state that's at. Um, 
and talk with the rest of the leadership team and see when we're comfortable. We certainly try to bring it forward as soon as as it's ready and we can do that. Um, so that's all I can say. So, so, so I'm going to make a motion. We have a motion. Well, I can make a motion to refer or defer a decision until we get more information from staff. And that would save this matter from being defeated. Okay. So you're looking to... Um, uh, and defer the matter until staff come back with additional information on our uh, communications uh, strategy and any advertising component. Okay, is there a second on deferring? Seconded by Councillor Berger. <coughs> okay, so I'll call the question on deferring. All those in favor of deferring? Opposed? Unopposed. Um, so it's deferred. Okay. So, okay. So, um, Council and CEO verbal reports. Oh. Yeah, there's one more item, I okay. think, 16.2. 16.2. .2. Okay. Sorry, in the uh, supplemental package. Oh, in the supplemental, yep. okay. Page, page 23, Your Honor. Okay. Actually, I think there's 16.1. Oh, 16.1 then is replacement pages so we are we've dealt with that so it's just 16.2 then okay so 16.2 we have a letter here um, from mid-america venture capital corp they're requesting a tax amendment to include a 10-year stay at the ru2 annual residential tax rate on the above properties commencing on the date of the rezone approval to ctz zone it's proposed that taxes would increase to the CTC annual tax rate based on a percentage of space built and occupied versus the potential build out size. Is, can this even be done um, to our staff? Your Worship, uh, when we started negotiating uh, with this company with regards to uh, proposed development, and, uh, just so you know, this, this piece of land is known as the large property. It's between Gatewood, Ga Gatewood Road, Eustace Road, and Highway 14 or West Coast Highway, I should say. Uh, when they first approached us with regards to tax exemption, they were talking about uh, rezoning it to the CTC zone and only being taxed on a portion that they were going to develop and then phase out, and then the taxes would go along with the phases they built. When this letter came along, this was a bit of a surprise to us because now they're asking for the 10-year exemption on taxes totally. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it came to me directly, and that's why it, it took a little bit of time to get to you because I had to forward it through uh, info at Souk. Mr. Blackall? Yes, uh, Your Worship, I'd just like to add, um, I did send around um, and is, uh, had a question on this when it was first in the council correspondence, um, and I did respond to all of council on that with... with um, kind of where this is done before and an example of that with the, the phasing regulation. Um, but this is asking for something a little different than that. Um, it, it is uh, seemed to be asking for uh, basically a 10-year exemption or a freeze at the rural rate instead of the CTC rezone rate. Right, so that's how I'm reading it is that um, they have the atten intention at some point to rezone to commercial but they want to pay to stay at rural residential. I thought I, um, wouldn't that be deemed assistance to business? I, yeah, I, I'm just, on, I'm uncomfortable with it. Councillor Casper? Well, um, you know, I've never, you know, I would never support this type of maneuver. Um, if, if someone has a problem with the value, then they have a right to go to the BC Assessment Authority and have the values reflect uh, the residential use. And um, if the property was in fact being lived on and it got rezoned, then there are some provisions under 
I think the assessment act for um, for the rate to be um, calculated at the residential rate even though it's owned commercial and, and I know when I represented Langford many years ago that in fact was done on a large piece of property not this not a family large but it was a fairly large parcel that someone had lived on for a number of years and um, and the assessment authority recognized the residential use and they were assessed for value on that rate but you know really like I, I just you know I can't blame people for trying but you know what I, I don't think that that it would bode well in this community if we were giving somebody something different than we do all our other businesses in Souk because we have a lot of property that is sitting vacant in Souk believe it or not that is zoned for higher and better uses and it's the assessment authority that determines the real actual value and sometimes use is a very uh, determining factor and vacant land sitting there it might be zoned commercial but unless there's real estate sales and other activities that are going to target it and you know that's a fight with the um, with the BC assessment authority I just think that we would be putting ourselves at risk. But I can't blame somebody for trying. Okay. I move the letter be received and filed. All right, motion to receive and file from Councillor Casper and seconded by Councillor Ray. <coughs> Did we want to send should we be responding to the letter? I think just as a as a courtesy. Um, I would just uh, ask staff to respond back with the council motion. This motion was passed, and that's well. Should it pass, then that would be what we report. We write back. Okay. All those in favor of receive and file. Opposed? None opposed. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now I believe I can move on to 17. Um, council and CAO reports. I'd just like to remind Council that those of you in town this Saturday, it's our annual, the Rotary's annual trade show and spring fair. The opening ceremonies kick off just at 10 o'clock. And we do have a booth there as per our previous discussion. So thanks staff uh, for working on that. Yeah. Last week we recognized four outstanding community members for their volunteer contributions to our community. and. Uh, that was attended by all of us, so thank you very much for attending and to staff as well. I think the all candidates meeting for the provincial election is tomorrow night at 7, I believe, at the hotel. I'm pretty sure it's at the Prestige, so it's an opportunity to meet and challenge all the various candidates. And I think there's a leaders' debate on TV on the next one's on Wednesday. Um, Sort of it that I have in the nutshell, aside from my notice, um, there was two notice of motions. One went to the Parks Committee about extending the Great Trail. Um, the Great Trail is sort of the Vancouver Spine Trail, and I worked on it with Director Ben Isaac about having it connect through so that it would end up connecting all the way through to Harborview and end there, but it did fail because it wasn't in the work plan for this year, but it looks like staff at the CRD will be looking at doing that in the next year it just seemed that you come down this beautiful trail and then your option is the goose when we have this other piece of land that we're trying to encourage access to it makes sense to have it connect through and you continue that wilderness experience so it looks like although it was defeated this year we'll see it come forward in a future year and then with the health and hospitals committee it's about having regional services for health throughout the region not just located within the core so that's where I have a notice of motion going forward to that committee on the Wednesday and that's all I can really think of I was at UBCM executive meetings last week so you'll see more reporting out coming from that in the iCompass for those of you that subscribe to that um, our conference this year is in Vancouver and I believe our staff have made our accommodation arrangements for everybody already, but we'll be 
the registration will open up, I think, June 1st for early bird registration. The program has been finalized now, so we'll start to see that come forward as well in the near future. I mentioned the volunteer ceremony. Yeah, see, not listening. That's okay. <laughs> I actually thought I was that. <laughs> 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 Berger. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, I had a Sea Park meeting last week and just wanted to let everybody know that the golf course is opening on Wednesday. This Wednesday, yeah. So they've been working really hard on getting the greens and everything ready. There's a new um, greenskeeper. There's also a host there. Um, they also have a family renting the house that's on the property, so there are eyes sort of on it all the time. And now you can pay at Sea Park as well as at the course, whereas last year it was all done through Sea Park. So it'll be an exciting open. Any other pieces to report out from anyone? Councillor Loggins? Um, just one quick one that uh, the Tour de Rock team announcement is um, happening at Edward Milne this coming-ish, not this Friday, the Friday after Friday, May 5th. Um, it's just uh, something to watch out for because the whole team will be, will be there. It'll be at 11.30 to 12.15, so a really quick ceremony, jam-packed. Um, and it should be really exciting. It's the first time, I think, that the opening ceremonies happened in our community. So we always get them coming in the fall, but we'll get them in the fall and also get to open as well. Sorry, what time was that again? Um, it starts at 11.30 okay. in the morning on Friday, May 5th, till 12.15. Okay. Thank you. Anything else from members of council? Anything from staff at this point? I'd just like to uh, mention that the Director of Development Services and myself attended the MIA Risk Management Conference on Thursday and Friday. Um, it was a really good conference, and I think we've got some information from that uh, that we'll be reporting back to Council on, in particular around uh, the Building Act, change, the Building Act, and changes around that, which we discussed a little bit about tonight, to needing to go through our bylaws and. Etc. So uh, it was a good, really good conference. A lot of other issues, of course, dealing with parks and various risks, but uh, it was a good conference. So. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so we do have item 19, report of released in camera resolutions. We have three here, so I don't think there's any actions. It's just that's here for everyone's information. And we do need to close the open portion to complete an item that's in camera under section 91A and D of the community charter. So on that, I'll call for a motion to adjourn the open portion of the meeting. I'll move by Councillor Ray and seconded by Councillor Loggins. All those in favor, opposed, motion is carried. And thank you to the members of the public for hanging out with us this evening.